The Git Source Code Manager is a powerful tool for tracking changes in your development projects. Three of Git's most powerful features are branching, merging, and remotes. Branching and merging allow new features and experiments to be developed without impacting the main project code. Remotes allow many developers to collaborate on the same project. In this course, we will learn how to get the most out of each of these features. We will discuss the big picture concepts as well as walk through step-by-step -step examples. Along the way, I'll share best practices and give you advice for using these techniques in real-world situations. Git is designed to make experimentation and collaboration easy. It doesn't matter if your goal is to manage the code in your own projects, to collaborate with other developers on their projects, or to join and contribute to open source projects. These Git features are essential skills to learn and master. Let's get started learning about branches, merges, and remotes. Let's talk about what you should know before you take this course. Before you dive in, you should already have the fundamentals of working with Git. If you don't, there's another course in the library that can help you. It's called Git Essential Training, The Basics. In that course, we talk about the basic architecture of Git, the fact that it has three trees, the working directory, the staging index, and the repository. We talk about SHAs and how they're used as identifiers and learn how Git generates them. And we talk about the importance of the head pointer and the role that it plays. We also learn to make commits to track file changes. We learn to write commit messages, to add and to remove changes from the staging tree. And we learn to view a history of the commits and view details of a specific commit. We can compare commits using diff, and we learn how to undo changes, either to make commits that undo changes or to get old versions of a file out of the repository. These are all essential Git skills, and you need to have them already before you start this course, because this course is going to assume you have that basic knowledge so that we can build on it. In this chapter, we're going to learn how to navigate the repository's commit tree. To do that, we need to start off by talking about the ways that we can reference commits. We've covered a few basic ways already, but there are others that are useful to know. And we should begin with introducing a new concept called treeish. A tree in Git is a directory which contains files and other directories. If you drew a picture of the directory and it had many directories and subdirectories, they would branch out and look like a tree. Git uses the term tree-ish to refer to both trees and to identifiers which reference a tree. And a commit is considered tree-ish because it refers to a tree at the point when that commit has been applied. Tree-ish is an important term to know because it does show up in the Git documentation. If you go look up a Git command, it might say that you can use any tree-ish as a target of that command. In simple terms, a tree-ish is a directory, a commit, or a reference. Let's look at a few examples. You could have an SHA1 hash, a head pointer reference, a branch reference, a tag reference, or the ancestry of one of those. There are more advanced examples too, but these are the most common. We aren't ready to learn about branch and tag references, but let's look at the other three, starting with the SHA1 hash and the head pointer. We already know that Git takes a change set along with all of its metadata and sends it into an SHA1 hashing algorithm. And the result is a 40 character string. We can refer to that as the identifier for a commit. So if we want to refer to a commit, we can use that 40 character string. But we don't have to type all 40 characters or even copy paste them. We can use fewer and Git can still know which commit we're talking about. The minimum is four characters, but a good rule of thumb to be unambiguous is eight to 10 characters. But that depends on the size of your project. On a small project, six characters might work. On a really large project, you might need to use more. And you can use them with your git commands. So for example, git show, and here I've got eight characters representing the SHA1 hash, often just called SHA. It's the SHA for this commit. Git keeps track of the most recent commit using the head pointer. So the head pointer is a reference to the tip of the current branch. It's similar to an analog tape recorder. It's where the play head is positioned for recording new commits. Usually it points at the commit that you made last, but it can be moved around, and we will be moving it when we learn about branches. Git keeps track of where the head is pointed by using some files in the .git directory. And there's a couple of files that come into play together. The first is .git slash head in all caps, and that usually refers to something else, but that's the place that Git goes first to find out what it refers to. Most of the time, if we're on the master branch, it'll tell you that it refers to another file which is stored in .git slash refs slash heads slash master. Master is the default branch on a new project. 
So that's probably where the reference will be stored. And if you went and looked inside that file, then it would contain a SHA that would point to a commit. Now we don't have to go through and follow that whole process every time. Git does it for us. It follows those references until it gets to a commit. And we can just type git show head and get there. Let's try these out. Here I am in my Explore California project. So let's start by doing git log and let's see what commits are already there. Here is the top commit, the most recent commit. Notice it's SHA, and then it also says head and master here. That's letting us know that those are references that are pointing to this commit. It's very helpful. I'm going to type a Q so we can get back to the command line. Now let's just try referring to this SHA. I'm actually going to copy and paste the whole thing. I'll say git show, and then it will show me what's in that commit. Track explorer's directory. Now we made changes to the .git keep file in this commit, so there's nothing to really show us as far as content, but it is showing us this particular commit. Now we can erase some of these and refer to it by fewer, right? It shows us the same thing. If I hit the up arrow and I remove a few more, I can do four and it works. But if I go to three, then it doesn't. It says, I don't know, that's too few, right? It has to be four or more. And because the head pointer refers to this commit, we can also just type git show head and get the exact same result. It's a reference that points to the same commit these are all examples of this tree-ish type that you can use inside Git. In this movie, we'll continue our discussion of how you can reference commits in Git by talking about ancestry. If you remember, when we make commits, they form a long chain, and every commit links to the commit that comes before it. So most commits are going to have a parent commit, a grandparent commit, and even a great-grandparent commit. That's what we're talking about when we say ancestry. Let's start by looking at how you can refer to the parent commit. It's very easy. All you do is take a reference to a commit and then add a caret symbol after it. That's that upward pointing arrow on your keyboard. You may not use it very often, but it's useful here. It's a symbol to tell us that we want to take this commit and then go to its parent commit, the one that comes right before it in the chain. And we can do this with any kind of commit identifier. For example, we can use head. Head followed by the caret sign says, get the parent of the head commit, not the head commit, the one that comes before it. We haven't learned about branches yet, but we did touch on the fact that the default branch is the master branch. So if you want to ask for the commit that comes before the last commit in the master branch, you can also use that caret. There's another format. Instead of using the caret, you can use a tilde instead. So here you can see I'm using head and then tilde one, and that says go get the parent commit. Go back one generation. By default, that's also going to be one if you don't put the number. So you could just have head and tilde, and it has the same effect as head followed by a caret. But most developers don't use that. In this case, they would use the caret format instead. So you would have git show and then head with the caret after it. So that's the parents. If you want to go back to the grandparents, it's just as easy. You just add a second caret. This says go to commit DE14621F and then go to its parent and then go to its parent. And we can do the same thing with the head reference or any branch reference. We can use that tilde format as well. You would just use a two now because we want to go back two generations. And it's easy to see that we're talking about the number two as a shorthand for writing two carats, right? Two generations are represented in both cases. Again, most developers using this would still probably use the carats. Git show head and then two carats after it. If you want to go back to the great grandparents, well, then guess what you do? You add another carat. So you would have three in this case. Now here's where the tilde format starts to be useful, right? Because instead of having to type all those characters out, now it's shorter for us to start typing the tilde instead. So it's more common for developers to use git show head tilde three than it is to type all of those carrots. And you can keep going back as far as you need. You just need to add more carrots or increase that number after the tilde. Let's try it. Here I am in my Explore California site. Let's just take a quick look. We'll use git log. And let's take a look at what a couple of these are. I'll go ahead and hit the Q. We see here is the main commit. That's where head and master both point. The parent of that commit is this one right here. Stop tracking changes. The one before that is this commit, add database configuration file. And the one before that is this one, add.gitignore file. Okay, so now let's try referring to some of these. Let's start by just grabbing some of these characters here at the beginning. And I'll copy those. Let's say git show. Now we don't want to see this commit, we want to see its parent. So let's add a caret at the end, and now we should see stop tracking changes to dbconfig.txt. 
That's what we'd expect. I'll hit the Q to exit out of that. And let's add another one to see its parent. We went back one further to add database configuration file. And I'll add a third one to see add get ignore file. So I'm slowly walking up the chain by looking at the ancestry. And I can do that by just adding those carrots after the commit. Now, as I mentioned, once you start getting to three, then it starts to be easier for you to type that tilde three instead, and it returns the exact same results. And we know we can do the same thing with other kinds of references, get show head and its parent, or we could use get show master and get its grandparent. We get the same thing every time. These are all ways to refer to those exact same commits. It's going to be useful for you to have ways to quickly find the information and get that you're looking for, to be able to refer to commits that you want to examine, that you want to compare against other commits, or that you want to pull into other branches or manipulate in other ways. We know that a tree in Git is just a directory. In this movie, I want us to see how we can list the contents of that directory from inside Git. The command that we're going to be using is Git and then ls-tree followed by the tree-ish that we want it to use and to list the contents of. If you start out by asking git help for information about ls-tree, you can find out more and all the different options that are there. It tells you list the contents of a tree object. And you can see here it even mentions the word tree-ish that we just learned about. Notice also that it tells you down here that what it does is it lists the contents of a given tree object like what bin slash ls-la does in the current working directory. If you're used to using Unix or the command line on Mac OS, you know this ls-a is a way to just list the contents of a directory. If you're on Windows, it's similar to typing dir. Let's type q to get out of this, and let's just try typing git ls-tree on the command line with nothing after it. It'll complain because it's looking for a tree-ish as an argument. And you can see it says here, the usage, git ls-tree, then there's some options we could provide, and then tree-ish, and then optionally, we could provide a path as well. But that tree-ish is the important thing that we're missing. Now we know what tree-ishes are now, so we can type one, git ls-tree, and then a space, and I'm gonna use head. That's a convenient way to always just go to the head, the last most recent commit of the current branch I'm on. When I type that, it comes up and it gives me a listing for that directory. It looks a little different than the listings we would get in Unix or Windows if we were listing out a directory. You can see that it has a number of identifiers here, and it says that some of these things are blobs and some of them are trees. And as you might expect, a tree is a directory. So here's a directory called assets, here's a directory called explorers, and so on. The blobs are the things that are files. Blob is kind of a funny name, but it actually means binary large object. That's where it gets its name from, binary large object. So that's what it's saying. It's just saying this is some kind of a binary object in this case, a file, it's not a tree. So for example, what we're seeing is a listing of the directories at the point of the latest commit, right where head is pointing to. If we want to go back and look at what it was further back in time, we know how to do that now using the ancestry, and it goes back one. Now it may take you a second to notice that there's a difference between the list. The last that we commit that we made was a commit that added the tracking of this directory here, explorers. And you see it's not listed here. We have explorers.html, but explorers is not listed underneath it. So you can see we went back in time one and we see a different listing. You remember when we typed get ls tree without anything after it, it also told us there was this optional path at the end. We can put a space after the tree-ish and then specify the path that we wanted to look at. So that lets us look further into those directories. So let me just go back. Let's look at the head. So there's our listing. Now let's do the same thing, but I'll put a space and then let's type assets. I'm not gonna put anything after it right now. I'm just gonna type assets and hit return. Now what it's showing me is a pattern matching. It's showing me all of the things in the head that match this pattern. What I wanna do is I wanna see the files that are inside there, and to do that, I need to put a slash at the end. That says, I'm not interested in this tree, I'm interested in what's inside that tree. Now, it shows me that inside there are three files called images, JavaScripts, and style sheets. Each of those is also a tree, and so I could keep going further down to see all of the files and directories that are in there. LS tree is a good way to go back and examine the state of a project at a previous moment in time to see what files and directories were there so that you can explore them further. One of the commands in Git that you're going to use the most often is the log. In this movie, 
I want us to talk about how you can filter the commit log in order to find the results that you're looking for. We already know the basic git log command, git space log, and then it returns a list of the commits going backwards in time with the newest commit at the top and the very first commit at the very end. It also puts it into a pagination program. You can see that colon at the bottom of the screen, letting us know that there's more results. We can type a space or an F to go forward to the next page, B to go backwards, or Q to quit out of it. By default, we're seeing all of the results that are in the log throughout the entire project. Now let's talk about how we can filter those results. The simplest filter is just simply to limit the number of commits that we're seeing. We can use git log, space, and then a dash followed by a number. I'm going to use three. Now git log returns just three commits to us. If we're really just interested in those first three commits, that can be more convenient than having that pagination open up. We can also filter it by time. Git log, and then space, and then dash dash, and then there's a couple of keywords we can use here. Since, everything since a certain date, and there's a synonym for that which is after, everything after a certain date. I'll use an equal sign, and then we can provide a date, and the date can be in a couple of different formats. The easiest one is to put the year, followed by the month, followed by the day. So here I'm asking for everything from January 1st, 2019 going forward. Now that's every commit in my project. So when I hit return, I get back everything. I'll hit Q and then let's hit the up arrow and let's make it a little more precise. I wanna see everything that happened since and let's put in 04-13. You see those commits that are on the screen are from April 14th. So this is everything from before that day, just one day's worth of commits. So now, you can see I'm seeing just those commits instead. In addition to having since, the opposite of that would be until, and the synonym for that is before. So everything until a date or before a date. So now I'm gonna see all the commits until the 13th of April. I'll hit return, and you see there's only one, that initial commit I made on April 12th. In addition to exact dates, you can also use relative dates, and you can specify those a couple of ways as well. It's hard for me to demonstrate those because the time that you're watching this is different than the time that I'm showing you but you can look at everything in the log until quote, three days ago, and I can just provide a phrase, and it's pretty good about parsing those phrases, or I can use two dot weeks or three dot days to specify the time, and of course I can combine all of these together so that I can limit the start date and the end date that I'm looking for. If you're working on a project with several people, you can also filter the log by the author. Now in this case, all of the commits were made by me, so there's not really a lot to filter on there, but for example, I could put author is Kevin. It'll go through and find every commit where the author string includes Kevin. Now, just to show you that that does work, let's change this to Sally. And now it's showing me everything in the log that has Sally in the author, and there are none. Author is not the only thing that we can search on. We can search all of the commit made metadata for a string by using git log and then grep, which is a way to look for regular expressions, then equals, and in quotes, we can put whatever regular expression we wanted to search for. Now, you don't have to know all about regular expressions. You can just use a simple string. Let's say that I wanted to look for initial. Now it returns initial commit because it sees that initial is somewhere in that commit message. That can be super useful. We also can look at commits between a certain range of commits. Let's do a regular git log. And you'll see here, this is the last commit, but let's go back here a couple of commits. I'll type a Q and then I'm just gonna grab this part of the commit and I'll copy that. And now I'll clear the screen, let's do git log this time, let's do it everything from that commit, dot, dot, to the head. So everything from that commit going all the way to the head, if I left this blank, it would do the same thing. Or if I put in another SHA instead, it would do everything between those two SHAs. I'll hit return, and you'll see that I see just the three commits. Not the commit at the beginning, it doesn't actually show me B44, whatever. It just starts there, everything after that, all the way up into and including the head. And the last thing I wanna show you is one of the most powerful. Remember we can use git ls dash tree on the head and get a listing of the files that are there. We can filter our git log by changes to a certain file or directory. So in this case, I've made a number of changes to explorers.html. I can ask git log to focus on explorers.html. Now I only get changes that are related to explorers.html. I can see just changes that affected this one file. I can do the same thing with the directory as well. Any changes to any of the files or directories inside that directory would be reported to me in the git commit log. This is one of the most powerful ways to find out what commits have affected a particular file. 
So we've now learned how to filter by number, by date, or by author, by an expression somewhere in the commit message, by a range of SHAs, or by focusing on a particular directory or file name. And all of these can be combined together. There's even more. If you want to use Git help, you can look at log and see all of the different options that are available to you. I think these are the ones that you're going to find the most useful. In this movie, we're going to talk about how you can format the commit log so that you can better use that data. One of the most useful things you can do with the git log is to look at the actual changes along with each commit. And we can do that with git log and then dash p. p is for patch. It's another way of saying it's the change set. A patch is the same thing as a change set. What is the patch that would change it from one condition to another? So the dash p option will show us each and every one of these. When I hit return, we're going to see a list of all of our commits in the commit log. The first few of these don't have a lot to view in them. So let's scroll down a bit. Let's hit the space bar or the F key and go forward. And now you can start to see add git ignore file, right? There's my git ignore file. I can use the arrow keys to go down and I can see the actual changes. The plus signs indicate what was added to the file. If we go a little further down, you can see that there's minus signs whenever we take something away from the file. So if we're changing something, then we're both removing one thing and putting a new thing in its place. So you have both a minus and a plus. So in this case, even though we're seeing two lines, what we're actually talking about is a change to a single line. We're removing something and replacing it with something else. We're removing something and replacing it with something else. This can be very useful to allow you to see changes without having to show each and every commit. You can just kind of browse through them, paging through it till you find what you're looking for. Another useful one is git log and then follow it with dash dash stat. This will show you statistics about what was changed in each commit. Let's hit return, take a look. You can see here, it gives us those pluses and minuses to tell us what was changed. But it doesn't give us the actual changes, it just gives us statistics about it. Two files were changed, one insertion, two deletions. Let's hit space so we can go down and see a few more of these. You can see resources here. There were three insertions and three deletions. Now we'd have to look at it to be sure, but this very well could be that there were three lines changed. Remember, because a plus and a minus equal a change to a line. And if we scroll down just a bit further, you can see here I'm making a lot of changes to a lot of different files, and we see the results of all those changes lined up here. So it really gives me an idea. So it really gives me an idea of what was changed and how much was changed in each of these files. So it gives me an idea of which files were changed and by how much. We can also just change the general format of our log using git log dash dash format and then an equal sign and then a keyword saying what format we want to put it in. By default, medium is going to be what it is. If we use medium, that's the same as if we didn't specify anything at all. If we use short, then we get a shorter format. Notice that that's a little different. Let's just do a regular git log. You'll see that there's a little bit more information there. See the date appears. And if I go up and do it with short format, you see the date disappears. This is a list of the options, the keywords that you can provide to format. You can have one line, short, medium, which is the default, full, fuller, email format, and raw. Each one of those is going to provide a slightly different format. Let's take a look at one line real quick. I'll just change this to one line. I'll clear my screen. And you can see, if I expand my window here, we get a nice one line view of all of those changes. Now that's taken up largely by this huge 40 character hash, the SHA at the beginning of each one. And that's useful, but we don't need all 40 characters and it's taking up a lot of room. So there's also another version that's very handy called git log dash dash one line. And this adds in another option which shortens that hash. So if you want one line, you may be better off using this one instead. You can see it's the exact same information, but we're just getting those first seven characters of the hash. Another nice format feature is graph. So git log dash dash graph. And you'll see that it graphs out all of my commits. You can see this line running down here, down the side. Now, right now, my graph is pretty simple because I just have one branch. We're going to be talking about branches in this course. And once we start branching off code, merging back in code, then this graph will begin to show us the path that our code takes. Even better than just graph on its own is to use git log dash dash graph dash dash all and then dash dash one line and then dash dash decorate. Using all four of those together gives you a nice simple map 
And if you have other branches coming in, you'll be able to see where they weave in and out of your code. Using these techniques to format the commit log will help you to be able to see what your code is doing so that you can better understand it and extract the information from it that you're looking for. In this chapter, we're going to be talking about branches in Git. Branches are one of the most powerful features in Git, in large part because of how easy they are to use. It's as if Git wants you to branch, and getting the most out of Git will mean using branches often and effectively. In Git, branches are cheap. They're easy to create, they don't take a lot of processor power, they don't take up a lot of storage space, they're easy to delete, and they're easy to work with. That means branches make it easy to try new ideas. Let's imagine that you have your master branch that you're working on, and suddenly you get an idea for something, but you're not sure if it's gonna work out or not. Instead of making a lot of commits to your master branch and then trying to undo those if it doesn't work out, instead, you can create a new branch and try your ideas there. If those ideas don't work out, you just throw away the branch, and you haven't tainted your master timeline with those mistakes. If it does work out, then you can fold those changes back into the master branch through a process called merging. Branches also allow you to isolate features or sections of work. This is especially useful when you're collaborating with others. Let's imagine that we have a project and we want to revise the user signup section. We can create a branch separate from our master branch to work on just that feature. We can even collaborate with others on that branch. Meanwhile, other developers can continue working on the master branch. When our new feature is finally complete, we can merge it back into the master branch so that everyone can work with it. This is a very common practice when working with Git. When we create branches, there will still just be one working directory. All the files that we're working with will still be in that same project folder. It's not like making a complete duplicate of all the files and folders in a project. When we switch branches, Git will switch to the new context quickly. It will make all the files and folders in the working directory match what is stored in the branch. It will swap out the two sets of changes. For example, if we're working on our master branch, and then we switch to our user signup feature, now our working directory will include the updated code with all those user signup changes in it. When we switch back to the master branch, those changes will go away. We'll be back to the code that's in the master branch. Git will handle swapping out all of those files for us, making all of those changes, and it does it very fast. Let's take a look at an illustration of what branching looks like just to make sure it's clear. We have our master branch. That's the default branch that every project starts with. So we start making our commits. After we make four commits, we decide we want to try revising the navigation, but we're not sure if it's going to work out. So we create a new branch. When we finally make all our changes and have everything like we want, we commit those changes to that new branch. The commit is now on a new branch. It's not on the master branch. If someone else has the master branch checked out, they won't see our changes. We can switch between the master branch and the revised navigation branch, and each time, Git will make the files and folders in our working directory match. Let's imagine we switch back to our master branch, and we make some more commits there. Our revised navigation branch is still in its other state. When we're finally ready to merge in the changes from revised navigation, we will merge it back in. It will create a new commit to merge in the changes from the revised navigation branch. Now, the master branch contains all of the changes in the revised navigation branch. Now we can go back to revised navigation branch and make more changes and merge those back in again. And we don't always have to merge things to the master branch. We could have many branches and we can merge changes between those branches. Before we start creating branches, I want to revisit this illustration again, but I want to talk about the location of the head pointer. I think it's important to understand. We have our master branch and we know that the head pointer always points to the last commit in the master branch, the tip of the current branch. Once we create a new branch though, that changes. When we create the new branch, at that point, head still points to commit 534DE. Both the master and revised navigation at this point are exactly the same. There have been no additional commits made, so head points to the same commit. It's only once we make new commits to the revised navigation branch that then the head moves to a new commit, a commit that's not on the master branch anymore. We can switch back and forth. If we switch back to the master branch, then the head points to the tip of the current branch, and that's the master branch here. If we switch back to the revised navigation branch, then the head pointer will switch back and point to the tip of it. It's like a playhead on a tape recorder that determines where new commits will be recorded. I make more commits on the master branch, and when I'm finally to ready to merge back in the revised navigation branch, it creates that merge commit and the head moves to that merge commit. Keep this overview in mind as we begin creating and working with branches. In this movie, we're gonna learn how to create branches. Before we create our first branch, let's just start by looking at the branches that are there currently. 
If I type git space branch, then it will show me a list of the branches. When I hit return, you see it comes up and there's only one branch. It's the master branch. And by default, that's the name that every Git project gives when you first initialize the project. It says, all right, all commits are gonna be on one master branch. That's the starting point. Notice that there's also an asterisk over on the far left and that it's colored green. That's to indicate that this is the current branch or the currently checked out branch. At the moment, there is only one branch, but once there are several, only one of them will be designated as the current branch. Okay, now let's create a branch. I told you that creating branches was very easy. It really is. Git branch and then a space and then the name of our branch. I'm going to call my new underscore feature. Branch names should not have any spaces in them. They can contain letters, underscores, and numbers. When I hit return, then it creates my new branch for me. It didn't give me feedback that it did, but if I type git branch, now you can see that there's two branches where before there was only one. Notice that master is still the currently checked out branch. New feature exists, but I'm not switched over to it. We'll talk about switching branches in the next movie. Before we do that, let's investigate a little bit further what happened here. How does git know which is my currently checked out branch? Well, remember we have that head pointer and we know that we can look at the contents of the file in the git directory called head and it'll tell us where the head points. The head points at the tip of the master branch. That's how it knows. That's how it decides to put that asterisk and color it green is based on what's in this file right here. And we also saw that this ref's head that's being referred to here is actually a directory as well. And we can look at the contents of that directory. ls-la on Unix will do it. Dot git slash refs heads. And let's not type master. Let's stop there at heads. And this will be the directory. We'll hit return and you'll see a list of the files that are in the directory. So we've got master and new feature, two different files, two different branches. That's where it's gonna store the references to the head of each branch, the tip of the branch. And then that head file, all it has to do is change its reference. Instead of saying refs heads master, it just has to change to refs heads new feature. And then it'll point at that new branch. Let's look at the contents of each of these files, the master and new feature file. cat get refs heads master. And you can see that it points to a commit that starts with DE1462. If I do the same thing for new feature, it points to the same commit. At the moment, they point to the same place, but eventually they won't. Eventually new commits will be made to one of these two branches and it will advance. The tip of that branch will move to another commit and the other one will not. It'll stay the same. Let's use our, our newly learned command, git log dash dash one line and we can see those commits and see that that is currently the tip of the branch. And it even tells us that the head points to master, but new feature also points to the same place. So head, master, and new feature all refer to the same commit right now. Okay, now I think we're ready to learn how to switch branches. We'll do that in the next movie. Now that we know how to create a branch, let's see how we can switch to it. In the last movie, we learned to use the git branch command, both to view a list of the branches and also to create a new branch, and we created a new feature branch. And we can see both of those here, and we can tell that master is the currently checked out branch, the branch that we're currently working with. If we go to our working directory, that's the code that we're gonna see. If we wanna use the new feature branch instead, well, then we need to check it out. So we use the command git checkout, and then the name of the branch that we want, because we may have many of them. So git checkout new feature. Now it says switch to branch new feature. Type git branch again, and you can see that it has changed. And now my current working directory is new feature. That means that the head pointer is now pointing at new feature. And if I make commits, they'll go on the new feature branch, not on the master branch. We can confirm that if we take a look at that file, cat.git slash head. And you can see now head points to the new feature branch. So let's try making a commit there. If we switch over to our project and let's take our project and let's just drag the whole thing into the Atom text editor. So we'll open up the project, we see it, we'll have all the files we can work with. And let's make a change here. After welcome to explore California in the title, let's just add a bit of text that says dash affordable outdoor tours. Then let's save that file. Now we've got some changes. Let's come back over here and let's commit those changes. We can use get status to see the changes that we have. And we should already know that we can check those in with git and then commit dash a for all changes that are in my directory with m to provide a message. And let's make the message modifies 
title of index.html. All right, so now we have a new commit. Let's use git log dash dash one line, and we can take a look at those. Now notice it tells me here that my master branch is on this commit, but my head and new feature branch are now on this new commit. Let's go back and switch to our master branch. We can use git checkout again, and this time we'll use master. So now it's switched to the master branch. So we now know how to create branches, and we know how to switch between them. And hopefully you can already see that it's a very efficient way to work with your code. That's why it's called a source code manager, because it effectively manages your code. In the previous two movies, we learned how to create branches, and we learned how to switch branches. We don't have to do them as two separate steps, though. We can actually do them all together. And that's what I want us to see how to do in this movie. The first thing you want to do is figure out which branch you're on currently. Because if we're going to make another branch, it matters which branch we're on, where the head is pointing to, because it will branch from that point. So if I'm on the master branch, git log dash dash one line, it's going to branch from this commit. If I'm on the new feature branch, then it's going to branch from the tip of that, which is that additional commit we made. And we made a change to the title of the index.html page. That's what's in that additional commit. So let's say that this new branch I want to create, I want to make use of what's in new feature. So I really want to branch off of there. So the first thing I need to do is make sure that I check out the new feature branch. Now when I type get branch, it tells me that I'm on the new feature branch. And when I create a new branch from here, it will include that additional commit right here, D4, F3, and so on. Now we already know how to create a branch off of master, and creating a branch from here is the exact same way. Git, and then branch, and then the name of the branch we want to create. So let's call it shorten underscore title. Now, if I did this just like this, and I hit return, it would create a branch, but it would not switch us to it. That's what we saw before. So in order to switch us to it, we're going to change it. And instead of branch, we're going to use checkout, but with the dash B option. So it's going to check out a new branch called shorten title. It'll do it all in one step. It creates the branch and checks it out. So I'll hit return, switch to a new branch called shorten title. So we know it created it. It didn't exist before. Now it does. Get branch will show us that it now exists, and we switch to it at the same time. So what we're essentially saying here is check it out as a new branch called shorten title. So let's make a change to the shorten title page. I'm going to go back into the Atom text editor. You can see that that code is there, affordable tours. But let's take out this part here, welcome to. Let's just make it explore California dash affordable outdoor tours. So I'm going to save that. Now we have an uncommitted change. We can see that with get status. Here it is. We can use git add to add it. And notice here that it says, after we use git add, use git checkout with a dash dash with a file name if we wanted to discard those changes. The checkout has another meaning here. It's not just for checking out branches. This is saying check out from the current branch, a file, check out the branch. So just notice that. Checkout is used in both contexts. What we're really saying to git is, go get these set of changes and bring them into my working directory. All right, so let's commit these with git commit dash m, shorten the title of index.html. Now it's committed. Git log dash dash one line. And we can now see that there are three branches. Master points to this commit. New feature points to this one. And shorten title and head both point to this one. Most developers use checkout with the dash b option to both create and switch at the same time. Because most of the time, as soon as you create it, you're going to want to start working with it. So it makes sense to just do it in one step. We've seen how easy it is to switch branches in Git. But there is a potential roadblock that can keep us from switching. And I want us to look at it. Inside my Explore California project, I already have a couple of branches. You can see I have master, new feature, and shortened title. And the currently checked out branch is shortened title. You can type git status, and we can see that Currently, I have nothing to commit. Everything has been committed. My working directory is clean. Let's now make a change. Let's go into our project, and let's change Explore California from being a dash to being a colon. So I'm just going to make that one tiny little change. Let's save it. Now I have a change. If I type git status, you'll see that the change is there. These changes are not committed. Let's try it. Let's type git checkout master. Git won't let us do it. And it tells us, it says your local changes to the following files would be overwritten by checkout, index.html. And then it tells us, please commit your changes or stash them before you switch branches. 
and then it refuses to do it. So what's happening here? When we do a checkout, remember what it's telling Git is to get files and bring them into our working directory. Well, this says, well, if I did that, I would destroy changes that are sitting in your working directory. And I don't know anything about those changes. I don't know whether they're important to you or not. So I'm going to take the safe path and I'm going to ask you to decide what you want to do with them so that I don't overwrite them by accident. If there are changes you don't want, you can remove them. If there are changes you do want, then you can take steps to keep them. But it's not going to make that decision for you. Not all uncommitted changes keep you from switching branches. You cannot switch if the changes in the working directory conflict with what's in the other branch. So that if you brought those other changes into your working directory, it would be necessary to get rid of your changes. But you can switch if the changes in the working directory could be applied without conflict. In this example, we made changes to the title line of the index.html page. But if my changes had been to a different file, if I had made changes to explorers.html, then it wouldn't give me a problem. Those changes would be still in my working directory after the change. It's also possible to switch if files are not being tracked. So Git doesn't have them in the repository, then it's no problem. There's no conflict. It's really when there's a conflict between the two sets of changes that it's an issue. When you have that kind of conflict, you have three options. You can either commit the changes to the current branch so that you go ahead and have them stored as a commit, and then the head pointer can just be moved to another branch. No big deal. They're stored and there's no chance of them getting lost. Or if you don't want the changes, you can remove them. The easiest way to do that is just to check out the current file again so the changes disappear. And then the third option is to stash the changes. And we'll talk about how to do that later on. The stash is sort of like a little pocket where you can put the changes and then pull them out later when you're ready. But that way they're not in your working directory anymore and it solves the conflict. Let's solve this one by keeping our changes and checking them into the current branch. We'll say git commit with the dash am option and we'll use swap dash for colon in index.html. Now my change is committed. Git status shows that I have a clean working directory. And now it's no problem for me to check out master or to use git checkout to come back to shorten title. If you want to experiment on your own, you can try making changes to other files in the project and see if it'll let you switch without committing them first. Or you can add new files to the project and see if it objects to those. You'll see that it's only changes which conflict with what's already in the other branch that prevent you from switching. Once we have several branches, we have the ability to compare them to see what the differences are between their change sets. Let's see how to do it. And let's start by just typing git branch to remind ourselves what branches we have and what the current working branch is. So at the moment I'm on the shortened title branch. In order to compare two things in git, we can use git diff. And we can use it to compare two files or any tree-ish. So that would be, in this case, a branch. Let's pick the master branch. We'll use dot dot to compare it to the new feature branch. Notice that I'm not on either of those branches. I can diff anything that Git knows about. I'll hit return, and it'll come up and it'll tell us what's the difference. We can see very clearly that there's a change to this one line, and we can see what that change is. We can also change this instead of new feature. Let's do master compared to shortened title. Now it shows us the difference between the master branch and the shortened title branch. Or we could do git diff with new feature dot dot shortened title. We can compare those two. Now obviously there's only one change that we made between those, so that's the diff that we're seeing, but if we had hundreds of changes, then it would show us all of those hundreds of changes. And these can be flipped around too. For example, I was using new feature dot dot shortened title. I could instead flip those around and make it shortened title dot dot new feature. I'll hit return and you'll see that it gives me the same changes, but they've been reversed. Now what used to have a minus has a plus and what used to have a plus has a minus. And if you're not clear on that, let's just hit the up arrow. We can see them side by side and you can see that it's just flipped them around. So what was on top is now on bottom and vice versa. And it tells us here at the beginning, which one it's calling a and which one it's calling B. That's based on the order that I sent them in. It just calls them A and B here and assigns minuses and plus to them. Now, typically, you can put the older branch first so that you can see the changes that have occurred since that point in time. But older can be a tricky term in Git because branches can diverge in weird ways and different commits can be brought in from other places. So it's not always in a perfect chronological order. But as a general rule, the older branch should go first. You can also use the color words option 
After diff, we'll type color-words, and now we see the same diff but in a different format. Now it's showing us the changes on a single line instead of putting them on two separate lines. If you've got a long paragraph of text, it can be very useful to have it line up the words in this way instead. Now remember, it's not just a branch that we're looking at, it's a tree-ish. A tree-ish is a directory or something that points to a directory. And that includes commits and tags and branches and everything else, even the head pointer. Those are all tree-ish. They're tree-like things that we can use. One of the things we can do is we can refer to the ancestor of a branch. So not just the tip of shortened title where the head would point, but we can go back to the commit before last. So I'm now comparing new feature to shorten title and going back one feature. And it tells us what the difference is there. Or we can go back two, feet, two commits and you'll see that there's no difference. Why is that? Well, because that's the point at which we branched off shortened title from the new feature branch. Another useful tool is being able to see which branches have been merged. So here's my list of branches. I'm currently on the shortened title branch. If I wanna find out what other branches have all of their commits merged into this branch already, then I can type git branch and then pass in the dash dash merged option. So this tells me that all of the commits that are in master are in shortened title. And all of the commits that are in new feature are also in shortened title. Let me show you if I switch and say, get checkout new feature. Now I'll hit the up arrow and we'll do get branch merged again. Notice shortened title is not included in the list because it has some commits that are not in new feature. It only shows branches whose tip commits are reachable from the named commit. It essentially goes backwards up the commit tree looking for the tips of the other branches to know whether they're included or not. We can also say get branch dash dash no dash merged and it does the opposite. Unfortunately, unmerged doesn't work. You'll have to remember that it's merged and no merged. Knowing which branches are fully included in another branch is very useful, especially when we start deleting branches. We can make sure that we're not accidentally deleting unmerged commits. Now that we know how to create branches, let's learn how we can rename our branches. First, let's remind ourselves what branches we have. Git branch is the command to do that. You can see that I have three branches and one of them is called new underscore feature. And that's my currently checked out branch. Now new feature isn't a very well named branch. I did it at the very beginning. We really would rather have something descriptive so that people know what it is so that I can remember five weeks from now what this feature was all about. So what was this feature about? Let's use git diff master with new feature. And we can see what changed. We changed something in the title. Let's say that we did this for search engine optimization purposes. So let's rename it something like that. Let's call it SEO underscore title. So in order to rename a branch, let's go look at the documentation, get help and then branch and find out what it tells us. If you take a look here and you look down at this line, you'll see this dash M option. And if you scroll on down the documentation, you'll see that that's short for move. You can also use dash dash move as well. And that's how we rename a branch. We move it, we move it from one name to the other. So moving and renaming are the same thing. Notice that it wants a new branch name and then old branch name is in square brackets. That lets us know that this is optional. By default, it's going to take the current branch that we're on. But if we give it two names after the dash M option, it'll assume this is the old branch and the new branch. So we could rename a branch even if we're not currently on the branch. But I'm gonna go ahead and just type Q and branch with the dash M option. And I'm on the branch I wanna rename. So let's just give it a new name. We'll call it SEO underscore title. Now, get branch has renamed my branch to the new name. It's that easy. Now, you do wanna be careful if you've shared these branches with someone else. We haven't talked about that yet. We'll learn about working and collaborating remotely. Once you do that, you don't wanna start renaming your branches if other people are already using them by another name. At that point, you'll start having to force the changes when you push them up, and then it may get confusing. So you either rename things before you start sharing them with other people, as long as it's only you working on it, it's not a problem, or you're gonna to have to jump through a few more hoops if you wanna push out a new name for other people to use as well, so that you can all stay working in sync. We've learned how to create branches, work with them, and even rename them. Now let's learn how to delete them. So first, let's remind ourselves what branches we have. You can see that I'm currently on the SEO title branch. Let's all switch to the master branch. Whatever branch you're on, 
Let's switch to the master branch and we're gonna do that with checkout. Git checkout master. And I want us to all be on the master branch because I want us to create a new branch from here. So I'm gonna use git branch to create that branch. I'm gonna call it branch to delete with underscores. Now notice I'm just using the branch command, not checkout dash B. So that means that I created the branch, but I did not switch to it. That's important. If you actually did the checkout dash B option, that's fine. Just now check out master again so that you're on the master branch. If we want to delete this branch, it's pretty simple. We just type git branch and then use the dash D option in order to delete it. So we had dash M for move or rename. Now we have dash D to delete and let's tell it which branch we want to delete. It's, it's branch underscore two underscore delete. When I hit return, it deleted it. It's that simple. Get branch, and we can see that it's gone. Now, as you can see, that's pretty powerful, right? We just deleted an entire branch of code. You may be wondering if that's too powerful, if it's too easy to lose your changes. Fortunately, Git has a couple of checks in there to make sure that you don't accidentally do something dumb. The first is that you can't be on the branch you're trying to delete. That's why I said we should all make sure that we were on the master branch. It's sort of like being in a tree. If you're standing on a branch, you don't want to saw off the branch that you're standing on. You want to switch to another branch first and then cut off that branch. Let's try another example to demonstrate. Let's use git checkout this time with the dash B option and create that branch to delete again. Git branch. Now we can see it's there and I'm on that branch. Now let's try to delete it. Git branch, I'm trying to saw off the branch that I'm on. And it says, sorry, you cannot do it because it's checked out. That's the one that we're currently using. It's in your working directory right now. I can't delete it until you switch to something else. So that's the first protection Git offers. Let's see the second one. Let's make a commit to this branch. Let's go into our text editor. Let's just make a simple change to index.html. Instead of welcome to explore California, let's change it to explore California colon tours and more. We'll save our change. We'll come back over here. Let's commit those changes with git commit dash am. We'll say changes title. Okay, so now we do git status. We see that there's nothing to commit and we're still on that branch to delete. Now let's try deleting it. I'll hit the up arrow. It won't delete it because I'm on the branch. So let's try git checkout master. Now I'm on a different branch. Now let's hit the up arrow and try and delete it from here. It says, wait a minute. The branch branch to delete is not fully merged. If you're sure you want to delete it, run git branch with a capital D instead. What this is doing is telling me there's commits here that I'm going to lose forever if I make this change. Are you sure you want to do that? It's not fully merged. And we saw we can do git branch dash dash merged to see. And in master, there's nothing that's merged. If I do git no merged, you can see there's several branches that have changes that are not yet merged into master. So if we do know that we want to get rid of those changes, we don't mind that there's commits in it that are not yet merged anywhere, then we can hit the up arrow and change that lowercase d into an uppercase d. It's sort of like having a safety to make sure that you don't do something dumb. And now I can type git branch and you can see that it did delete it for me. So when you're going to delete, always switch off of the branch use a lowercase d to start, and if it complains, then if you're sure you want to delete that branch, even though it's not merged, use the capital D. Now that we know how to work with branches, let's modify the command prompt that we use so that we can tell what branch we're on currently. The program that we're going to use to do that is called git prompt. It's just going to add the current branch name to our command prompt. It's going to be a similar process to what we did with git completion.bash. We did that in the git basics course. We're going to download a script, and then we're going to tell our command line program to load it up so it's always available. Now, it's possible that you already installed it when you installed git completion, or it may already be installed for you. There's an easy way to check. The first thing to check is to see whether you're seeing the branch name right now when you're in a, inside a project. If you see a branch name here in your command prompt, then you'll know that it's configured. But you may not have it configured all the way, so another good way to test is to try underscore underscore git underscore ps1. That's the little program or function that's installed by the script. And if we have access to it, then we know that we have that code installed. You can see that I don't. So I need to take some additional action to get things set up. We can download the git prompt script from the git open source repository that's hosted on GitHub. And the URL is github.com slash git slash git. 
You can see I'm on github.com slash git slash git. And this is the entire source code repository for the git source code manager. What I'm interested in is just that little script, which is inside the contrib directory, inside completion. You can see it right here, git-prompt.sh. You can also find it by searching up here for just git-prompt. Search in this repository to limit the search only to the GitHub source code, and you'll see it pops up right here. So either way you get to it, you'll notice that this is then the script, and it has instructions at the beginning. You can follow their instructions, or I'm going to give them to you as well. Either one will work. We want to first get this script and put it on our local computer. So we're going to do that by clicking on raw to get a text only version of this code. And then we can either copy and paste that code into a file, or we can just go up to file, save page as in Firefox and choose our user directory. So here's my user directory, git dash prompt. I'm going to go ahead and call mine dot bash. You can call it dot sh. In fact, if I click this, it'll complain and say, hey, don't you want to put sh? I'll keep the file ending bash. And then we can hide Firefox and go to our command line. Now let's navigate to our user directory, which I can do with the tilde, or I can navigate there by going to users Kevin Scogland. Once I'm there and I type ls-la, I'll get a listing of the files. You can see the completion script that we installed in Git Basics up here, and it has a dot in front of it. Here's the one that's down here for us, and it doesn't have a dot. That dot just says hide this file most of the time. I don't want to see it. It's just going to be an invisible file that'll do work behind the scenes. So I'm going to move that git prompt file to have a new name, git-prompt.bash, but with a period in front of it. Then when I hit return, it'll have moved it. I can type ls-la again to see it. There it is. Now I need to install it. I need to tell my code that every time that the a new window opens, it ought to run that script so that that code is available to me. So what I want to do is edit this bash profile, or if you have a bash RC file, those are files that the command line automatically runs every time you open a window. And the code that we're going to put into that file looks like this. It has an if statement that checks to see if the file exists. That's a little bit of fancy bash programming, but it's saying if this file dot git dash prompt dot bash exists, then do these two commands. The first command loads in that source code. The second command, is telling it to set our prompt. PS1 is a variable that stands for prompt string one. And then we have a string after it saying what it should set that prompt to be. And there are a couple of symbols in there that you need to understand. Backslash W is the base name of the current directory. You can modify it to be a lot of other things. It can be a username. It can be a full path. You can customize that to your liking. Everything from the dollar sign and those parentheses, that's the important part that we're dropping in. The dollar sign parentheses is a command substitution, and we're calling that git ps1 function that we just installed inside the script, and then we're providing a string to it. We're saying what we want it to look like. So inside the double quotes, you can see I have another set of parentheses and percent %s. Percent %s is a placeholder where the branch name will appear. If you want something besides the parentheses around it, maybe you want square brackets or curly braces, you can put those instead. Those don't matter. You can customize it to your liking. And then after the dollar sign parentheses, you can see it ends with space and then a greater than sign in the space. That just gives a little bit of space before I actually start typing the prompt. Let's go back to our command line and I'll clear my screen. And let's start by just typing echo dollar sign PS1. This is the variable that's currently set for my prompt string and nothing is set. Let's do PS1 equals, and then we'll put in equals arrow arrow space. And go see my prompt now changes, right? My prompt now has two arrows in front of it. That's that prompt string. I'm going to use the nano text editor, just a very simple text editor to edit that dot bash profile. You can also use a different text editor. Notice that I've already got a PS1 being set here. That's okay. I'm going to come down here and below where I've got git completion bash loading, I'm going to put in a similar bit of code that just says to load the git prompt bash script if it's available source will load it in and export will set that value. You can pause the movie if you want to copy this down. Once you have it added in, then I'm going to type control X to exit and yes to save the file and hit return. And then I'm back in my command line. Now, if you hit return, you'll see it hasn't changed yet. That's because it hasn't loaded that code for the first time. It will load the code when I open a new window. So let's close this window and open a new one. And you'll see that it did change. Now it's showing me the current directory. Tilde is my user directory. If I navigate into a git project, my git project is in 
Documents, Explore California. Now you can see it shows me the current directory name followed by the current branch. Get branch shows me that it's master. If I did get checkout SEO title, it switches me to SEO title and every time it's gonna remind me what branch I'm on so I don't have to type get branch each and every time. Let's go back to master. Oops, I mistyped it. There we go. Now I'm back on the master branch. It's really handy and can help you to avoid mistakes by always reminding you what current branch you're working on. In this chapter, we're gonna learn how to reset branches. And we're gonna begin by first looking at the three different types of resets that you can do. Reset is gonna change the files in the staging index and or the working directory to the state they had when a specified commit was made. A simpler way to think of it is, you're saying, make my project look like it did back then. What it's actually doing is moving the head pointer to a specific commit. And then it may also be changing some of the files in your staging index or working directory as well. There are three types of reset. There's soft, mixed, and hard. Let's look at all three of them. A soft reset is the simplest. It moves the head pointer to the specified commit, but it does not change the staging index. It does not change the working directory. So essentially we're just moving the recording head where our next commit will go to another place in our commit tree. That's it. We're just moving to another place and putting the head there ready to make new commits. The way that we do perform a soft reset is using git reset and then dash dash soft and then the tree-ish that tells it where we want to reset to. This could be a commit, it could be a branch name, it could be a tag, anything that is considered a tree-ish can go there. We just have to be able to tell git where it should move that head pointer. The second type of reset is a mixed reset. This also moves the head pointer, but in addition, it changes the staging index to match the repository. So if we had other changes that were in our staging index ready to be committed, it would be replaced by whatever the content we've specified. Now it still does not change your working directory though. It just moves the head pointer and the staging index. And you do it with git reset dash dash mixed and then tree-ish. And this is the default choice. If you just use git reset without specifying an option, it'll do the same thing. It'll be a mixed reset by default. And then there's the most serious of all of them. There's a hard reset. This moves the head pointer, changes the staging index to match the repository, and changes the working directory to match the repository. Essentially, it says, let's go to this point in time and let's make everything look like it was at that point. Forget about anything staged or anything in my working directory. I want to essentially roll back in time to that specific point. And you do it with git reset dash dash hard and then provide it a tree-ish. Now that we understand the three types, in the next three movies, let's try out each one so we can get a better understanding of how they work and why they're useful. Let's learn how to perform a soft reset and see why you might find it useful. As we've seen, soft reset moves the head pointer, it does not change the staging index, and it does not change the working directory. And the way that you call a soft reset is just to type git reset and then use the dash dash soft option followed by a tree-ish, which could either be a SHA from a commit or a branch name or a tag name or something else, anything that points to some point in the repository's timeline. So why would you use a soft reset? You use it to return to an old state, but leave code changes staged. That makes it useful for amending one or more commits. We're saying, let's roll back in time, but let's hold on to those changes and let's keep them in the staging area and in the working directory as if they're just not committed yet. It's a little bit similar to git commit amend. Now it's important to note that anytime we do a reset, previous commits will be discarded. If we go ahead and start committing again, those old commits will be unreachable. So be careful about amending commits which have already been shared with others. Most of the time you only wanna do resets when you're working in your own private repository and you have not pushed up those changes to any remote repository or shared it with any collaborators. Let's try performing a soft reset. First, let's type git branch so that we see what our branches are. You can see that I'm on the master branch. Go ahead, if you're not there, make sure that you check out the master branch. And then let's make a new branch that we can use to play with with our resets and not worry that we're gonna break anything. We already know that we can use git checkout with the dash b option in order to both create a branch and check it out at the same time. I don't wanna create a branch off of master. I wanna create it off of shortened title. Now I could check out that branch and then perform this command, but I wanna show you that we can do it all in one step. Git help checkout, 
will tell us right here, you see the dash B option. It tells you that you provide the new branch name and then you can provide it a starting point for that branch as an optional next argument. So let's try that. Let's do git checkout and we're going to do the dash B option. The new branch name is going to be reset underscore branch and the starting point that we want to go from is going to be a tree-ish, which in this case is going to be shorten title. So that's where it'll start. It'll be a branch off of there. And sure enough, if we now do get log, let's do just the first three commits here. You'll see that tells us that the head points to reset branch, which is also the same thing that shorten title points to. Okay, so now we have our playground to work with. So let's make a few commits. Let's go into our text editor. Let's change some things. So right now we've got Explore California colon affordable outdoor tours. Let's change this to instead be an arrow. Explore California, and then we'll put a little greater than sign there. And let's do the same thing on the contact page. And let's save that, and let's do the same thing on the explorers page. Just those three. Okay, make sure I've saved all of those. There we go, they're all saved. I can see them in red here. If I come back over here, they can say get status and there they are ready for me to stage. Now I'm going to go ahead and say git commit dash am and we're just going to call it commit a for now. Okay so those are committed and then let's come back over here and let's make a few more changes. Let's go to mission. Let's do the same thing. Save it. We'll go to resources and we'll save it and support and save it and last of all tours. Now there's a few other pages in there, but this is going to get quite a few of them. All right, so now we come back and look at the commits that are ready to go. And I'm just going to hit the up arrow and I'm going to commit this one as B. So committing it as B. Now if we do git log dash dash one line, you can see there's commit A and there's commit B. Now let's do a soft reset. The reason why we might do the soft reset is we say, wait a minute, why did I make those into two separate commits? That doesn't make sense. I want to combine them together. Or maybe I want to change something else about the commits. Now I could do an amend, and amend would only change commit B. I can have access to that one easily. But what if I also want to make a change to commit A? We know that Git protects the integrity of all these commits, and it's not going to let us just go in and edit commit A by itself. And it's certainly not going to let us squash it together with commit B. This is where a Git soft reset can be helpful. Now before we go any further, let's just copy this SHA that's right here. You can just copy it to your clipboard, or you can write it down, or you can put it in a text document. But let's make sure that we have that one. And yours will be different than mine. So make sure that you have your own SHA written down somewhere. It's always a good idea before you start moving the head pointer around that you remember where you started. All right, so now let's try that git reset. Git reset dash dash soft. And where do we want to tell it to go to? Well, let's just tell it to go to the head and back one. That's the parent, the parent of the head. Now it goes backwards. Let's hit the up arrow and do git log one line and I'll do the dash three option. We don't need to see all of them. And you can see the last three commits. Commit B is now gone, right? I've now moved the head pointer back. Let's do git status and look what's here. Look what changes are in my staging area ready to be committed. All of those changes. It essentially just brought them back. It rolled back that commit and kept everything in my staging area. Now let's try git reset soft and let's paste in that SHA that we copied down. That will move the head pointer back again. I'll hit the up arrow. Now you'll see it's back at commit B. Commit B is still there. All we did was move the head pointer, the playhead. We moved it back. If we had started making new commits, then this commit would be abandoned. It would be unreachable from our repository timeline. But right now, we haven't made any changes, so we can still just move back to it. All right, now let's try going back to, let's go back to get reset soft head. Let's add another caret symbol after head. So that's the grandparent commit. Now when we do the git log one line, you'll see that we've moved back to where we started. Both of our commits are now not included. Git status shows that all of those commits are waiting for us. They're in our staging area, ready for us to recommit them. And that's where I think this is really useful. So now let's commit them all with git commit dash m edits to page titles. Now they're all there. Let's hit the up arrow to take a look at the log again. And you can see that now I have one commit. It has a new SHA. The old ones are gone. And git show for that commit has all of our changes all inside of there.
They're all in one commit. We've squashed them together. So a soft reset is most useful when you want to back things up in the commit timeline and then recommit them again. Once we know how to perform a soft reset, you'll see that a mixed reset is very similar. Let's first remind ourselves the mixed reset is going to move the head pointer, but it's also going to make changes so that the staging index matches the repository, that is, it, the point where that head pointer is. But it's not going to make any changes to our working directory. Everything will still stay the same as it was there. The way we're going to call it is with git reset and then the dash dash mixed option and provide a tree-ish as an argument, such as a branch name, a tag, or a commit SHA. And a mixed reset is also the default choice. If we specified no option, if we left out dash dash mixed, it would be a mixed reset by default. So why would we use a mixed reset? A mixed reset allows us to return to an old state, just like a soft reset does, and it leaves code changes in the working directory, not in the staging, but in the working directory. It's most useful for reorganizing your commits. Again, previous commits will be discarded, so you need to be careful about changing commits which have already been shared with other people. Let's try one out. So I'm in my Explore California project. I'm already on this reset branch that we're going to be using like a sandbox where we can fool around and not worry that we're going to break anything. So let's start by going into our code and let's make a couple of unrelated commits. Let's go into contact.html. I'm just going to fold up the header. Let's go down to the main content and let's make some changes to this content. Uh, I see an extra space here. Let's remove that. And let's see, we do not publish these for anyone. Let's take that out, the exclamation point out. And if you are currently on a tour. Okay, so we've made a few changes there. Now let's go into explorers.html. And again, let's hide the main header, scroll down to the content, and let's look for a couple of changes we can make. If you have not signed up yet, and it is also a great way. Okay, so we've got a couple of those in there. You can make a few more if you want. The point is just to have a couple of different changes on a couple of different pages. If we go back to the command line and type git status, we see those changes. So let's commit them. git commit dash am. I'm just going to call it some edits for now. All right, if we do git log dash dash one line dash three, then we'll see our new commit, right? Our reset branch right now points to this SHA. Just like with soft resets, let's copy this SHA down so that we have access to it. So I'm just going to copy it to my clipboard, but you can also write it down or put it in a text document. Yours will be different than mine, so make sure you copy it because you can't follow along and use mine. We saw in the last movie that if we type git reset dash dash soft and we provide the ancestor to the head, that's the parent, as our tree-ish, that it will then move backwards one commit. git log dash dash one line dash three will show that we've moved back one. And we know that if we look at the git status that we'll see all of those changes haven't been lost They've just been moved into the staging area and they're ready to be committed. Okay, now let's roll things back forward again. Let's do that by doing a git reset soft and let's paste in that SHA that we copied down. Now things should be back like we started. Now we're back to our sum edits commit. Now let's try a mixed reset. Git reset dash dash mixed and we're going to do the same thing. We're going to go back to the parent commit and we'll see the difference. Now we get a message that tells us that there are unstaged changes after the reset. Git status shows us those. It's the exact same code, but it's not sitting in our staging area waiting for us to commit it. It's just in our working directory. And that's the difference. We can still do the same moving back forward again. We can do a mixed reset and git status. We'll show that we're back there and everything's clean again. So we can still go backwards and forwards. The difference is whether or not our changes are sitting in the staging area or if they're just in our working directory. All right, one last time, let's do a git reset mixed, but this time let's leave out mixed because it is the default option. So git reset to the parent commit, that will take things backwards, git status, we'll see them. They're now in our working directory. So now let's add contact.html. Now it is added to our staging area and we can now commit it, git commit, dash M, we don't want to use dash A because that would also include explorers, just contact is what we're looking for. And let's say changes to contact page. And then I can do git commit with the dash A option to get the other changes, changes to explorers page. Now I've broken them up. I'll go up till I find that git one line again. There it is. And now you can see I have two different commits. So I've 
essentially taken my code back down into my working directory where I can rework with it, make whatever changes I want, and then recommit them. Now that we know about soft and mixed resets, we're ready to learn about hard resets. Hard resets move the head pointer, they change the staging index to match the repository, and they change the working directory to match the repository. We call it the same way we've called the others, using git reset with dash dash hard followed by a tree-ish. Now a hard reset is going to return to an old state and discard all subsequent code changes. It's useful to permanently undo commits, to make a branch look like something different completely. So the previous commits and all changes will be discarded. That's why it's called a hard reset. It's the toughest one. And the same caveats apply. Be careful about amending commits which have been shared, because once you share code, their repositories are still going to have those commits, and yours won't, and it becomes hard to sync things back up again. Let's try a hard reset. I'm inside my Explorer California project, and I'm already on my reset branch. So let's first start by doing git log dash dash one line dash three, just to see the last three commits. So here's my head pointer pointed at this commit. Let's copy down this SHA just so we make sure we have it and we can come back here again. You can write it down or just put it on your clipboard like me. All right, now let's try doing a hard reset. Git reset dash dash hard and let's go back to the parent of this commit. We're just going to roll things back one commit to the parent head and then the upward caret. Now if we do log one line, you'll see that it went back one commit, right? Now the head pointer is pointing back one commit just like the other ones did. But let's do git status. My changes aren't there. They're just gone. Git doesn't try to keep track of them. It doesn't put them in my staging area or my working directory. It just says, you know what? Forget about them. Move everything so that it is as if my repository is at the point of 4102524 and that other commit doesn't even exist. Now in truth, that other commit does still exist. We can reset back to it again. Git reset hard and I'm going to paste in that SHA and now it's there. I'll use git log to see it. But here's the thing. Old commits may not stick around. Commits which are abandoned will eventually get cleaned up. Git will keep them around for a little while, but at some point it does some housekeeping and it says, oh, you know what? There's all these commits and they haven't been used and they're not attached to anything. I'm going to just get rid of them. You can reset back to it in the short term, but in the long term it may be gone. Now where I think git reset hard is most useful is if you want to make one branch look like another. So for example, I'm now on the reset branch and we've seen that we've got a couple of new commits in there, right? And those are different than the commits that are on shorten title, right? If I want to make my reset branch look exactly like shorten title, well then that's where a hard reset can really help. Get reset, dash dash hard, shorten title. So now, guess what my log looks like? It looks exactly the same. The head points there and all of my code, everything in my working directory, everything in staging, all looks exactly like it does for shortened title. All those commits and changes I've made to reset branch, they're gone. I can do the same thing. Let's change it instead. Let's reset back to SEO title. Go back a little further in time. Now we look and we've rolled back further. Here's shortened title. It's still there pointing to something else. And you'll now see that my reset branch and my head pointer are both now at the same place as SEO title. This also makes another good point. If you have commits that you want to hang on to, but you also want to do a hard reset, well then make another branch before you do it. You can see that shortened title still gets held on to, even though I just moved off of it with a hard reset, because there's another branch that points to it. We just have to have something pointing to it. It's when we do a hard reset and there's nothing pointing at those commits that are later on that Git then feels like it's able to delete them during garbage collection. All right, last of all, let's just roll things back. Let's put in that commit again. So now we're back where we started. Oops, I did that to shorten title. Let's go up and let's remove that. Let's just take a look at the log where we can see now reset branch is back where we started. So Git reset hard is the most powerful and destructive of all the Git resets, but it has some good uses. It has the ability to change both your staging and your working directory to a completely different state. Just make sure you don't accidentally delete something or leave it abandoned in the process. In this chapter, we're going to learn how to merge branches. And we're going to start by learning the simple process of merging code from one branch into another. Let's say that we have our master branch and we've been working on it. And at some point we decide we want to branch off and we want to work on a new feature. 
called revised navigation. So now we've got a new branch, and maybe development has gone on in the master branch in the meantime, but we're working on this revised navigation branch. When we finally have everything just like we like it, and it's gone through code review, and we've gotten stakeholder approval, we're ready to merge it back into the master branch so that everyone has access to this new feature we've created. In order to do that, we need to create a merge. This merge will take the code that's in the revised navigation branch and bring it into the master branch. To begin with, let's take a look at our branches. And you can see I'm on the reset branch now from the last chapter. Let's change that. Let's switch to the master branch because we're gonna be merging code into the master branch. And it's always a good first step to check out the receiving branch where you wanna merge the code into. Now you don't have to do that, but it is a good default. So let's get checkout master. Okay, so now I'm on the master branch. What I wanna do is I want to receive changes and let's receive changes from the SEO title branch. So that was a feature branch. There were changes being made to it. Now we wanna bring those into the master branch. Let's remind ourselves what those changes are. Git diff master dot dot SEO underscore title and you can see the changes. So here's what we have right now in our master branch, and this is the version that we have right now in the SEO title branch. So the process of merging is very simple. If we're on the branch that we want to receive it, we just say git merge, and then SEO underscore title. It's that easy. It says that it's updating. It tells us the SHAs that it's updating. It says that it's a fast forward. We'll talk more about that in a moment. And then it tells us what files were changed, and gives us some stats about how many lines were changed, whether things were added or removed. I'll clear my screen and let's do git log dash dash one line dash five. And now we can see that master and SEO title both point to the same thing. And this commit we made here in SEO title originally is now in the master branch. If we do git diff master with SEO title again, you'll see that there's no differences between them. And we can also type git branch dash dash merged, and it'll tell us that SEO title has been fully merged in. Now, if this were truly a feature branch and everything was done with it, this might be the point that we would delete that branch because we don't necessarily need it anymore. Now, if we're gonna keep adding to it and making more changes, or if there are other reasons to leave it around to catalog those changes, we can keep it there. But now it's fully merged into master. When it goes smoothly, merging is that easy. You just simply tell it you wanna merge it in and it handles it for you. It figures out how to merge those changes together. But merges can be complicated. And throughout the rest of this chapter, we're gonna be looking at some of those complications. One good piece of initial advice is to always run merges with a clean working directory. You'll only further complicate things if you have some changes in your working directory while you're doing merges. You can either commit those working directory changes or eventually we'll learn how to stash them so that they're out of the way. But having a clean working directory gives you a good clean work surface to start your work with in case something does go wrong. We need to understand the difference between fast forward merges and real merges. In the previous movie, we learned how to do a merge. And I gave you an example of how a merge works by showing you a diagram like this. And we talked about how you would make a merge commit that would merge revised navigation back into master. Except that that's not what our master branch really looked like when we actually went to the command line and tried it out. Instead, it looks something more like this. We had not made additional commits on master. We had only made a new commit in our feature branch. So before we made our merge, the head pointer was pointing at the tip of the master branch. And then when we went to merge in the feature branch, what Git did was it looked at that feature branch and saw that if it followed the history back from BA8CE to 534DE all the way back to the beginning, that in the the process of traveling backwards that it ran into that head commit 534DE. So it realized that this was just an extension of master and that it could easily be moved in line with master. This is what's called a fast forward commit. We didn't need to actually make a new commit to merge things together. Git could tidy things up by just simply moving that code into the master branch. What I'm referring to as a real merge or a non-fast forward merge is when we have additional commits on master and then we need to have another commit that joins the two together. Let's examine this difference. So to begin with, let's review what we did in the last movie. We merged the SEO title branch into master. So let's do git log SEO title dash dash one line dash five. Let's take a look at the commits that are there. 
And then let's do the same thing, but let's come back here and put in master. Now it also tells me here head and master and SEO title, which makes it easy. But notice that the SHAs here are exactly the same all the way down the line. It's not actually a new commit. It's taking the old commit and just making it part of the line, the long chain of commits on the master branch. Now as a contrast, let's do get branch. And we have this other branch right here called shorten title. Let's look at how we could merge that in. Now right now, if we did it, it would be a fast forward merge. We can actually do that with git merge shorten title. And you can see it did a fast forward merge. And if we do git log master one line five again, you can see it added two commits here. This one and this one. Before it was on this one, right? It was back there. It just did a fast forward merge. It tells us right here, fast forward. Let's do git reset hard. We now know how to do that. And we'll go head and we're going to go back two commits. So I've got two carrots after head to indicate that it's this commit that we want to go back to. And then sure enough, if I come here and look, you'll see that we're now back where we were. So we undid the fast forward merge. Master has just now moved back in time. So now let's try to make it not do a fast forward merge. In order to do that, we need another commit on our master branch, something that the shortened title branch does not have. So let's make one. Let's go into our project. Let's go to the contact page. And right now it says contact us. Let's just change it to contact. I'll save the page. Then let's come back over here and let's make our commit. Get commit dash am change title of contact page. So now master has a commit that shortened title does not and shortened title has a commit that master does not. I'm going to clear my screen. Let's do get log dash dash graph dash dash all dash dash one line dash dash decorate. Notice now that get log with the graph shows me this branch, right? It shows me where things branch off here. The master branch is up here and this red line shows that it bypasses all of these commits. Whereas shortened title and reset branch contain commits that are not in master. So now let's do a merge that won't be a fast forward merge. The process is exactly the same. We say get merge and then shorten title. What's different is how it handles it. Now it says waiting for you for your editor to close the file. It's now going to open up my code editor and it's going to want me to put in a commit message and I can type anything I want here. Anything with a pound sign in front of it is going to be ignored. It's just a comment but I can put anything in. Most times you don't need to. It's just a simple merge. The message will be merge branch shorten title. We'll save it, close it up. And now when we switch back over here, you'll see that it made the commit and it says merge made by the recursive strategy. Now, if we say get log dash dash one line and five, you'll see that there's a new commit that's been made. This one didn't exist before. It's called 2223130. And its commit message is merge branch shorten title. If we hit the up arrow till we get to the graph, you'll see that it actually shows us that it merges it back in as well. Just like the graphic that I showed you earlier. Most of the time you'll be able to just let Git handle it and decide whether it should be a fast forward merge or a non fast forward merge. But I think it is still useful for you to recognize and understand the difference. We learned how to merge one branch into another branch. The process went smoothly. It was pretty simple. Unfortunately, it's not always that easy. We need to learn about merge conflicts and how to resolve them. A conflict occurs when there are two changes in the same line or set of lines in two different commits. So let's imagine that I have a line inside a file in my master branch and that line says git is great and it has HTML span tags around it. Now let's imagine that I make a new branch called new styles. After I've made that branch, myself or someone else makes an edit to the file in the master branch and commits it. And that changes to change the span tags into strong tags. Now at the same time, myself or someone else in the new styles branch makes an edit to the exact same line, but makes a different change. This time, instead of putting strong tags around it, they put emphasis tags or EM tags around it. So now when we go to merge these branches together, what is Git supposed to do? It's getting two sets of instructions. It has one commit in the master branch that says change it to strong tags. And it has a commit in the new styles branch that says to change it to EM tags. If these changes had been to two different lines in the same file, there would not be a conflict. 
Git would be able to incorporate both changes into the result. It would combine them smoothly. But it's when you have two edits to the same line that Git doesn't know what to do. So Git will mark the conflict and then wait for you to fix the problem. This is an example of a merge conflict. In order to demonstrate, we need to create a merge conflict. So let's do that. Let's make sure that you're on your master branch already. You can see that I am. If not, you'll want to check out the master branch. And then let's make a new branch. We'll use git checkout with the dash b option. Remember that both creates and checks out a branch. And we're going to call this one text underscore edits. Now I have my new branch. We can see it there and I'm already switched to it. All right, let's go into our project and let's make some changes. We're going to make our changes to the mission.html file. So open up this file and then let's scroll down to where the text is. I'm just going to kind of hide some of this so I can get down here. This is a big block of text here, and we're going to make text edits in this branch. Let's start by making a text edit to line 63 here. You'll see that it says, the adventure that will educate, inspire, and energize you unlike any other. Let's take away unlike any other. We decide that's a little too strong. So that's an edit to line 63. Let's go to the next line, and it says, and will provide you will an opportunity. Well, that's a typo. That should be with an opportunity. So let's fix that typo in that line. And then let's go to the next line and let's make a change here. Let's make it we have. And a little further down here it says we ask ourselves one question. Let's say we ask ourselves a question. And then there's quotation marks here after that. Now make sure that you make an edit to this line. You don't have to make the same edits I made. You can make other edits. But I'm going to focus on this one line because this is the line, line 65, where I'm going to try to create a conflict. So make changes to a couple of lines, but especially make sure you get one in line 65. Or if it's another line, just remember which line it is so that we can make sure we have a conflict in that line. Okay, so now I've got my edits. We come back over here, get status, and we see the changes that we made. Now let's commit those. Get commit dash am text edits to mission page. So now I've committed that to my text edits branch. Now let's go back to the master branch get checkout master. Now I'm on my master branch. Let's go into the mission.html file again, and you'll see that all of our edits are gone. Let's go through and make a few edits here as well. We'll provide you with, I'll make the same edit here, and then let's come down here a little further, and instead of having the and quote marks here, let's type ldquo, that's left double quote, and then over here we'll make this a right double quote. Let's add a few more single quotes as well. Let's do curly quotes here and we'll make this a right single quote character entity and I'll copy that and let's put the same thing here and let's scroll down a little more. Here's tours. Uh, let's see, weave. I'm just going to try and make all of those if I can find them all quickly. I'll change all of those into just being curly instead of straight. All right, I think I did a pretty good job there. I may have missed one or two. Oops, here's one right here. I just saw it. Let's make that change there. All right, I may have missed some, but I've got most of them. Okay, now let's make that commit as well. Come back over here and I'm in the master branch. Let's type git commit dash am replaces straight quotes with curly quotes. Okay, so now I have another commit here. And if we do git log dash dash one line, I'll just do five. We can see those lines. Here's the commit that I just made. Notice the commit before it is merge branch shorten title in. That was what I was doing right before that. Now let's hit the up arrow and let's just take the same look at text underscore edits. And you can see it's top five commits. It also has that merge branch shorten title, but it has a different commit right here, right? So they have two different commits that come after that 2223130 commit. That's where our conflict is going to be. All right, so now let's try to merge them. Git merge. I'm on the master branch and I'm going to merge in text edits. Auto merging, conflict, content. There's a merge conflict in mission.html. Automatic merge failed, fix conflicts, and then commit the result. Notice also that now my branch name is just not called master anymore. It's master, and then it has a line and it says merging, letting me know that I'm in the middle of a merge. That's very handy too. Let's type git status and see what it tells us. I'm on branch master, but I have unmerged paths, so I need to fix the conflicts, and then commit them. And I can use git merge abort to abort the merge. We'll look at that in the next movie. And then it tells me what the problems are. Here's the problem, mission.html, 
both files have been modified and I need to use git add to mark it once I've resolved it. There's no changes added and we're ready to take a look. All right, now let's go look at mission.html and inside this file, you should see something like this. You'll see a bunch of left facing arrows or less than signs followed by the word head. That's letting me know that's where my current head is. I'm on the master branch. So that's what the current state of the master branch is. If we scroll down, then we'll see a bunch of equal signs. And then we see the same text again. We are passionate about California and so on. We are passionate about California and so on, right? We're seeing that here. And then down here, we have a bunch of right facing arrows or greater than signs followed by the name of that branch, text edits, the thing we're merging in. So what it's doing is it's showing us both versions. This is a very common format for flagging merge conflicts to you. These are called conflict markers. So in the next movie, we're gonna look at these and learn how to resolve them. But just understand for now, this is the part that's in our current branch. And then everything that's down here below these lines is what's in the branch that we're merging in. Now that we've created a conflict and we can see how Git handles it, in the next movie, let's learn how we can resolve it. We've now learned what merge conflicts are and we've created one in our project. In this movie, we're gonna learn how to resolve them. There are three ways that you can resolve merge conflicts. The first is that you can abort the merge. You can just simply say, stop, I don't wanna proceed, let's back up. The second is that you can resolve the merge conflicts manually by going through the code and making edits. And the third is that you can use a merge tool to help you through the process. So he had tried to merge the text edits branch into our master branch. There was a conflict with the mission.html file, and we know that we're still in the middle of that merge. If we come over here and look at the file, we can see that there are merge indicators for the beginning of the head and the content that it has. It goes all the way down to here. And then below that is everything that's in text edits. So we have both of these here that we're ready to compare and Git wants us to figure out what needs to be done. Let's suppose that instead of trying to proceed with the commit, we decide after we take a look that that's not something we wanna deal with right now. We don't wanna proceed with the merge. Maybe we wanna come back and deal with it another time. So the easiest way is just to follow its advice here. It tells us up at the top, git merge dash dash abort. Git merge dash dash abort, and voila. It's like we never even typed the command. It just backs us right out of it again. Git status, I'm on branch master, my working tree is clean, the merge is done. So that's good, that's always a good way to just get yourself out of it if you made a mistake or if you're not ready to merge yet. Now let's try actually performing the merge and let's do it manually. I'll do my merge again. I get the conflict again. You see it change over here. Now I need to handle that conflict. So you can go through the text and a lot of times, especially if you're dealing with code, the lines are very short. So a line might be if X equals one. And then the line that it's been changed to is if X equals two. Well, it's very easy to compare those lines side by side. In this case, we have a block of text. So it's a lot harder because the lines are wrapping around. It's very difficult to find out exactly what change inside each one of those. One way that we can do that is we can come back over here and type git diff, and we can use the color words option we learned earlier, and we can compare master with text edits. Now it's comparing the tips of the branches. It has nothing to do with what's in my working directory right now. I'm just looking at those two branches, and I'm gonna focus on mission.html. And it'll come up and it'll show me what's different between those two files. Or another even easier way to do the same thing is just to say git show color words and then it will use the current branch. You could also put head here, it would do the same thing. And this will use master by default. That's the branch that I'm still on, even though I'm in the middle of a merge, I'm on the master branch. If I say show color words, it's gonna show me the differences in that current branch. So now it's showing me the differences between those two. So I can see what's different between the two branches. And I could just move this maybe to the side a little bit or something, and then go through and edit. Let's see if I can make all of my windows a little bit smaller here and move it over a bit. And then we can say, all right, energize you like any other. Okay, so that's one change. Now let's use this head as the one we're gonna use. This is the one we're gonna keep. So everything in head, we're gonna make exactly like we like. So energize you like any other, we're gonna say energize you. That is the change we want to add there. Okay, the next change a little further down is we have. Now, I actually like the fact that we had we have better. So I'm gonna keep that change, but it's simple really. I like that change, the right single quote, that's a good one. All these other quotes that we've got in there, those are better. So we're gonna keep all of those, but we also have this one here, one becomes a. So instead of one question, it's gonna be a, oops. 
So instead of one question, it's going to be a question. And let's see if there's any others here. I think those are all quotes related. Okay, so now we've got the two differences between them. So the head version is what we like. I'm going to take out these markers. I've got to manually remove the markers. And everything from here all the way down to the ending marker is all trash now. I can remove it all. So now I have one version. It's a version that I'm happy with. I could bring that up in a browser, take a look at it. If I was doing code, I could run a test suite on it. The point is make sure that you're 100% happy with this merged result. Once I have that, then I can come back over here, get status. It tells me that when I'm done, to mark the resolution, I do get add. Now it will not add the file if I don't take out those get markers. We need to take those out or it's going to check for them and say, oh, wait a minute, I see a get marker in here. You haven't finished your business yet. So let's do that. Let's do get add mission.html. Now it's added, but it gets status again, changes to be committed, and it tells me all conflicts are fixed, but you're still merging. This was a merge in a single file. It's possible that I could have had conflicts in five or six different files. I could have had conflicts in 20 files. I need to go through and fix each one in turn, and that can take a little while. Once I've got them all like I like, and I've got them all added to my staging area, then I just type git commit. I don't need to put any options after it or any message or anything. Just say git commit, and it will then go ahead and continue the merge process. In this case, it's going to open up the text editor and ask me what commit message I want to put on it. I'm fine with that one, so I'll just save it and close it, and then merge branch text edits. Git log dash dash one line, and you can see here it is. It merged it in. Now let's also use that neat trick we learned with git log using graph. We're going to graph all. We're going to use one line and decorate. You can see here was the commit replacing straight quotes with curly quotes. The little asterisk is on this line. That's my main timeline, master. I had this other branch, text edits, which had this commit where this asterisk is, 343. Three, and now I have a merge commit that merges those back together. Now we're not going to do it, but I just want to note that if you wanted to undo it at this point, if you for some reason weren't happy with this merge, all you have to do is git reset hard back to this commit. That will remove this merge commit you made, and now the master branch will be back on this commit. So git reset hard can undo your merges as well. The last thing I want to mention is the merge tool that I mentioned at the beginning. It's sort of a third option. Git help and then type merge tool, and you'll see the built-in merge tool. It's a conflict resolution tools. There's a number of different ones. The format is git merge tool and then dash dash tool equals, or it will use the merge tool that you have in your configuration by default. If we scroll down a little bit here, you'll see under the options, it tells us what the tool choices are. You can use emerge, gvim, diff, etc. All right, all of those are possibilities. And each one is essentially a little program that will help walk you through the merge. Now, I've never used them. I don't actually know which one is better, so I don't have a recommendation for you. I either make my changes manually or I use a graphical user interface tool. And we're going to talk about those later on. There are some programs that give you a nice visual interface and can help you to select which commits you want to keep and which ones you want to discard. In this movie, I want to talk about a couple of strategies that you can use to reduce merge conflicts. Merge conflicts aren't pleasant to have to solve, so if we can use some strategies to reduce them, it's going to pay big benefits. The first and simplest is just to keep your lines short. If lines are short, there's less characters in them, it's less likely that something's going to conflict, and it's easier to identify and fix conflicts when they arise. We saw this in the last movie when we had this long block of text. It was difficult to find what had changed in it. But if the lines had been very short, as they often are in code, it would have been easier. You also want to keep your commits small and focused. Don't make commits that are enormous in scope that touch on 50 or 60 different files, especially if those are not related changes. Instead, make a commit that does one single thing. It makes it easier for Git to merge that commit with other commits, and it's easier for you to go back into the history and see what was being done. You can go back and look at a commit and say, oh, I see what was being done at this point, and that'll help you to know which version you want to keep when you resolve the merge conflict. Also, try not to make stray edits to white space spaces, tabs, line returns. If you make those changes in both files, then Git is going to flag it as a merge conflict, even though it's actually a trivial change that really doesn't make a difference to most programs. So stick with either spaces or tabs and don't make line returns unnecessarily. 
and get the rest of your collaborators to go along with whatever plan you come up with. There's nothing more frustrating than having a long block of code that uses spaces to indent the code, while a collaborator uses tabs to indent theirs, and then you've got to try and figure out how to merge those two together. Because every single line will be different, but you've got to tease out which lines have significant differences. Another good strategy is to merge often. Merge from your feature branch back into your master branch as much as you can. Let me show you what I mean. Let's say that I have my master branch, and I also make another branch called text edits. It's going to be my feature branch. And I start making a commit there. My master branch keeps going and makes another commit. If I can incorporate the changes from text edits back into master, go ahead and do it. Then you can keep making changes on text edits. That doesn't have to be the end of the line for the text edit branch. It can keep having other changes. You can keep it around. Master can keep making other changes, and you can merge those changes back in again. You can keep that process going. Now, that's not always possible. Sometimes you have a long-running feature branch, and you have to make a whole bunch of commits, maybe over a week or even a month, before you merge those back into master. Some developers use feature flags so that the feature is present in the master code, but it's not turned on unless a certain flag is triggered. We're not going to go into depth about feature flags, but it's a technique that allows us to keep merging back in those feature branches and all the code into master regularly to reduce merge conflicts without actually activating the feature or the code for the public. Another good strategy is to track changes to master. This is a bit like merging often, but in reverse. Instead, when we have master, we have our text edits branch, master has some more changes. Now we can merge those changes from master back into our text edits branch. So now text edits has all of master changes. They've been resolved. It's a good habit too, because if there's a different person who's working on the text edits branch, it becomes their responsibility to resolve merge conflicts while they're developing. So if they're continuing to develop, there are more commits being made, then periodically they just have to come and merge those back in. And then finally, when the feature's done, the whole feature can be merged back into master. But at that point, there shouldn't be very many merge conflicts because they've been resolved along the way. All of that code should now be in sync, and when it's merged back into master, it should be a simple process. Merging master periodically into your feature branches is a process we call tracking. Using these techniques will help you to reduce the number of merge conflicts. In this chapter, we're going to learn about a feature of Git called the stash, rarely, without having to commit them. It's a lot like putting something into a drawer to save it for later. The stash is not part of the repository, the staging index, or the working directory. It's a special fourth area of Git, separate from the others. Before we learn to use the stash, let's create a situation where you would commonly need it. Right now you can see I'm on the master branch. I'm going to switch to use my shortened title branch. So git checkout shorten title. Now I'm on my shortened title branch. I'm going to make a change to my shortened title branch. I'm going to make a change to a file that I know is going to have some kind of conflict with the master branch. So mission.html, I'm going to try and create an issue here in the title, Explore California, I'm going to make it say our mission. So that's going to be my edit. Now let's come back over here and type git status. Now we have a change in our working directory, and it's not committed. And let's say that the mission page is still in progress. We're intending to keep making more changes. We're not ready to wrap things up yet. But I want to check out my master branch for a second. So I use git checkout master, and git says sorry. I, I can't do that. And the reason why is if I did, it would overwrite the changes that you just made to mission.html. So it says, please commit your changes or stash them before you switch branches. That's what we want to learn to do here. We want to learn how to stash those changes so we can then switch branches. The way you use the stash is you type git stash, and then you say save, and then you give it a name. And the name can be anything you want. You can just call it temp if you want. But it's good to give it a label that's descriptive so we can find it later. So let's say changed mission page title. Now it's saved the working directory and index state on shortened title, changed mission title page. If I type git status, now you'll see my working tree is clean. Those changes have been moved into the stash. They're not in my working directory anymore. And that now allows me to check out my master branch without a problem. No problem switching there, git checkout and I'll go back to shorten title. One other thing that I want to mention is that by default, Stash doesn't include untracked files. So let's say that I not only had a change that I had made to mission.html, 
but I also added a new page to the resources directory. Stash would not by default stash that resources change because there's not a conflict. And that's because there's just simply not a conflict. It can switch branches and leave that file sitting in my working directory. If I want to stash it, then if we type git help stash, we can see more about the different options. There's one right here, the dash u option or dash dash include untracked that will also include any untracked files and stash those as well. Now that we know how to put changes into the stash, we need to see how we view them. Viewing what's in the stash is easy. We use git stash and then list, and it'll show us a list that everything that's in the stash. Now you can have multiple things that are stashed. Right now I have one thing in the stash. It's this first item here, and you can see my label on it, changed mission page title. If I were to have more changes and stash those, then there would be another line below that, another line below that, and so on. We would have a list of all those little bits of code that we had stored away to deal with later. Notice also the syntax here at the beginning, stash, the at sign, and then inside curly braces, zero. It's a little awkward at first, but you'll get used to it. That's how we refer to each one of these stashed items. So I can type git stash and then show, just like we show a commit, we can show a stash, and then we can use that syntax, S-T-A-S-H, then the at sign, then inside curly braces, and then a number. In this case, it's zero, because it's a zero indexed item. The next one would be one, and then two, and then three, and then four. That's the ID number that lets us know which item we're referring to. When I return that, you can see it returns a diff stat by default, showing me what's in there. It's changes to mission.html, and there are two lines that are affected, one line that's adding, and one line that's subtracting. In this case, it's a change. Now, if we wanna actually see the contents of it, we can just say git show, but we can also use the dash p option. That's the same thing we used with log. With git log, you can use the dash p option, and it'll show you a patch version of each one. It'll essentially show you the changes. Now when I hit return, I don't see the stats. Instead, I see the actual change itself. So mission changed into our mission. So that's it. That's this little change set that's been stored there. And we can keep that change there until we decide that we're ready for it. I also want to note that changes in the stash are independent of the branches that you're on. So for example, you could be on the master branch, stash something, then switch to a different branch, and it would still be there. It would be visible to you in the stash, and you could use it from that other branch. It's really completely outside of the rest of Git. We're just taking a snapshot of a change and storing it away till later. We know how to store stash changes. We know how to take a look at what's in our stash. Now let's see how we retrieve changes from the stash so that we can use them. So in my Explore California project, I've already stored some changes. Git stash list will show those changes. We know that git show the dash p option and then the reference to the stash with at symbol and then the number inside curly braces and we can see what actually the change is being made. So the change is from mission to our mission. Now that's in our stash, that's not in our code. If we go and we look at the actual project code here, you'll see that it still just says mission. Let's see how we retrieve that change so that we can make use of it. The first thing you wanna do is figure out where you wanna use it. I'm already on the shortened title branch, but I don't have to be. This stash is available to me in all of my branches. So I can switch to any branch I want, but I do wanna be on the shortened title branch. So I'm in the right spot. Once I'm in the right spot, then I can use git stash and then pop. Now, if I use pop, it will remove a single stash and apply it to our working directory. And because I only have one, it'll remove just that first one. It'll pop it out of there so that I can use it. If I want a specific one, then I can say git stash pop and then tell it stash at and then zero inside those curly braces. Now I'm just gonna do it without just so you see what that does. Git stash pop. This is handy, especially if you have just stashed something for a second, then you go do something else. You come back, you wanna just pull those changes back. You just pop them right back out again. Notice now it gives me a status at the same time and says that it's been modified. If we come back over here, sure enough, it applied those changes. Now, if we look at git stash list now, you'll see that the change is gone. It's not there anymore. Now, pop will always do that. It will apply it immediately to the working directory, and then it will remove it from the stash. Another alternative is apply. So git stash pop and git stash apply. Let me show you what apply does. Let's stash these changes again. Git stash save, and let's call it changed mission title. Slightly different name than we had before, but that's okay. Git stash list, 
shows that it's in there. Now let's try apply. Apply does the exact same thing as pop does, except it doesn't delete it. It applies the changes, but it also leaves them there in case we want to apply them anywhere else. That way we could go to a branch and we could apply a patch, go to another branch and apply the same patch and so on. The same code could be reused. Git stash and then apply. Same thing, we could provide a reference after it. You see it did make the change. So mission.html has been changed, but if I go up and hit git stash list, you'll see it did not delete it. It's still there. The one last thing I wanna mention is that when you pop or apply changes out of your stash back into your working directory, it's possible for it to have conflicts. And if you do have conflicts, it'll work just like a merge does. Because essentially that's what you're doing. You're asking Git to merge the changes that are in your stash into your working directory, just like we merged branches together before. So you'll have to go through and resolve any conflicts that come up. Now stashes typically don't have that problem as often because they don't stick around as much. Often we just stash things for a little while, we come and bring them back again, whereas branches might be long running branches that last for weeks or even months, making merge conflicts more likely. In this chapter, we've learned how the stash works, and we've put code into the stash, we've learned how to look at a list of what's in the stash, and we've been able to retrieve code from the stash. There's one last housekeeping task we need to look at, which is how to clear the stash. If we take a look at our stash right now using git stash list, you can see that I still have one item in there. It's called changed mission title. Now I had used apply in order to apply those changes, so they also are still in my working directory as well. And our mission is the change that I made. Let's go ahead and stash these changes again. Even though we already have them stored here as a stashed item, changed mission title, we're gonna do the same thing, just so we have more than one item in our stash. So git stash, save, we'll just call this one delete me. Now I'll hit the up arrow till we get to get stash list. And now you can see I have two items in my stash, one called delete me and one called changed mission title. We already saw that one good way to get items back out of that stash is to use pop. Pop will take those changes and delete the item at the same time. And it's going to do it in reverse order. You'll notice that the newest item I just put in was placed right here on top as zero. And the older item is now one. So the newest item is always at the top, and if we use pop, it pops off that newest item. That is one way to delete items from the stash. Another way is to use git stash drop. Git stash drop, and then the identifier for what we want to drop. So in this case, we're gonna drop stash at, and let's go ahead and delete the one that's at zero. So it says now it's dropped it. Hit the up arrow and do git stash list again. Now you can see it's gone. We're back to having just that one item. Now, my changes are gone from my working directory. I stashed them and then I deleted the item. So they're not in my working directory. Before you start deleting items from your stash, make sure that you are okay with having them permanently deleted. Use pop or apply if you want to retrieve them first. Another way that we can clear the stash is just to use git stash clear. And git stash clear clears everything. Now our stash will be completely empty. There's no items in it at all. So to review, there's three main ways we can delete items from the stash. The first is by simply just using git stash pop, which will apply a change and drop it. The second is to specify git stash drop and say which stash it is that you want to drop. And then the third is git stash clear, which will clear all items out of the stash. Use it with caution. In this chapter, we're going to be looking at remote repositories, or as we call them in Git, simply remotes. In everything we've done up until now, we've been working locally on our own computer. Local Git repositories do not even need a network connection. We can use version control on our local files without sharing them with anyone else. However, Git becomes more powerful when we collaborate with others, and that's what remotes allow us to do. With a remote server, we can take the changes we've made in our local Git repository and put them on a remote server so that other people can access them. They can view and download the changes that we've made. Then they can make changes of their own and upload them to the remote server where we can then view and download them. And Git makes this process easy. The remote repository often serves as a central clearinghouse for all changes in a project. Git is distributed version control. There's no real difference between a repository on the remote server or the repositories on the local computers of the collaborators. All Git repositories have commits, branches, a head pointer, and so on. It works exactly the same. The fact that one Git repository is designated as the central clearinghouse is really just a matter of convention. Let's take a look at the big picture of how this works. So we have our computer, 
And we have a simple branch here called master that has a couple of commits in it. Now we also are going to introduce a remote server. What we want to do is take our commits and we push them to the remote server so that other people can see them. We call this process a push. At that point, the remote server creates the same branch with the same commits with the exact same commit IDs referring to all of them. At that point, our collaborators have the ability to see those commits and they can pull them down and work with them. At the same time, Git also makes another branch on our local computer that's typically called origin slash and then whatever the branch name is. Here, I've called it origin slash master because it is mirroring the master branch. So origin master is a branch on our local machine that references the remote server branch. And it always tries to stay in sync with that remote branch. Right now, it looks like all three of these are in sync, but it doesn't have to always be that way. We continue developing, we make a few more commits, then we do a push, that code goes up to the remote server, and it takes note of those changes in origin master. When other people make changes to the remote server and contribute them there, we need to pull those changes down so that we know about them. And we call that process a fetch. When we fetch the changes, at that point, they come in to our origin master branch because that's what's doing. It's keeping those two in sync. Fetch is essentially saying, sync up my origin master with the remote server version, but it does not bring code into our master branch. So now our computer knows about the change and we have it locally. At this point, we can get on an airplane and fly somewhere. And while we're on that airplane, we'll have access to that commit 923EA. But it's not in our master branch until we do a merge. At that point, it'll be brought into our master branch and everything will be back in sync. Now, this example is oversimplified. And you can see that on my computer, there are a lot of duplicate commits. Git doesn't do things that way. It's smarter about the way that it stores these commits. Like with other branches, it uses pointers to refer to objects. We already know about the head pointer that points to the tip of each branch. Let's take a look at how it works with the remotes. So this is the same kind of example before. When we do a push, it creates the new commit on the remote server. And at that point, it doesn't actually duplicate all those commits in the branch origin master. Instead, it just sets a pointer, a head pointer for the origin master branch, a reference to that commit. Then when we make a new commit, Git moves our master branch pointer to that commit. Everything now is not in sync, but when we finally do a push again, the commit gets pushed up to master, it moves the master pointer, and also the origin master pointer at the same time. If someone else makes a commit, then of course the master pointer on the remote server moves. When we do a fetch, what actually happens is that it downloads that commit and it moves the origin master pointer to it, but our master pointer stays pointing at the other commit. Then when we finally perform a merge, at that point our master pointer moves to that last commit and that's a fast forward merge like the ones we've seen before. So as you can see, origin master is really just a branch. It's just like all the other branches that we've been creating and working with. The only difference is that it's a branch that tries to stay in sync with what's on the remote server. The reason that matters is because it's possible for someone to make a commit on the remote server while we're also in the process of making a commit on our local machine. It happens all the time. I'm making changes to one part of my project, and my collaborator is making changes to their part of the project. So they put their changes on the remote server, and then when I do a fetch, it brings those changes down to my computer. You see that Origin Master does point to those two new commits. But in the meantime, on my branch, on my local computer, I've made a new commit that's labeled BA8CE. Now our two branches have diverged, so we need to do a merge to bring them back together again. And that process works exactly the same way is when we were working with merging branches in the previous chapters. Origin Master is just a branch, so we can merge them together. It can either be a fast forward merge or it can be a real merge that creates a new merge commit. This means that generally speaking, the process you'll go through when you're working with a remote is that you'll make your commits locally, then fetch the latest code from the remote server to bring your origin branch in sync, then merge any of your new work you just did into that branch and push the results back up to the remote server. If the process seems at all unclear now, it'll become second nature soon enough. Once you have an account with GitHub and you've told GitHub to create a remote repository for you, then now we need to add information about that remote repository to our local repository. In the previous movie, we set up this Explore California repository on GitHub. And in the process, it said, okay, we're all done with setting it up. If you wanna go from here, there are a couple of ideas on, on how you can proceed. The one that we're interested in is this one right here. Push an existing repository from the command line because we already have an existing repository. 
and these are the commands we're going to be using. We're going to come back here in a moment. For now, let's just jump back to the, our command line, and we're already inside our project. It doesn't matter what branch you're on. We're going to just type git remote, and that will show us a list of the remotes that we have currently. It doesn't give us any because we don't have any remotes. It works a lot like git branch does. Git branch shows us our branches. Git remote shows us our remotes. Now let's add one. The process of adding one is to type git remote and then add, and then the alias or name that we want to give to this remote. And you can call it anything you want, but the convention in git is to call your primary main remote origin. So if in doubt, if you don't have another name in mind, call it origin. And then after that, you're going to paste the URL that applies to origin. It's almost like creating an alias or a shortcut in your operating system. Origin is going to be a name that's going to point to a URL. Let's go back over here and you'll see that that's what it's asking you to do here. Get remote, add origin, and then it suggests this URL. So we just want to copy this URL right here. You just get everything from there down to there and we'll copy it. We'll come back over, we'll paste it in and hit return. Now take a moment to notice that the URL here is specific to my account. So that means that you need to use one that matches your account. It has to be github.com slash your account name slash explore California. It won't work if it's mine. I made a private repository. It also means that in the exercise files going forward, the exercise files are going to have my name in there. And if you want to use them, you're going to have to take a moment and change it to use your account name instead. Otherwise, it'll be trying to contact a private repository. I'll show you how you can edit it in a moment. Now that we have our repository created, I can type git remote, and this time it tells me that I have one remote named origin. I can also use remote with the dash B option, and it will give me more information. It'll show me what origin points to. It gives you two different ones, one for fetching and one for pushing, but they almost always are the same thing. It is possible to have more than one remote, but most times it's not necessary. Typically you only have one, and typically you call it origin. The way that you can see where these remotes are stored and configured is by looking in .git slash config. So I'm going to use the cat program in Linux to take a peek at that file. Any text editor will do. And you'll see here it added an entry. It says remote origin. Oops. It says remote origin. And then it has the URL. And then it has information about what it should fetch. What kinds of information should it be downloading? You won't need to mess with this unless you need to edit the username so that it's your account name instead of mine in the exercise files. If you're not using the provided exercise files, then this should already be set correctly. So now our local repository has the information it needs to reach out and contact that remote repository. The last thing I want to show you is that if you need to delete a remote for any reason, which is kind of rare, but you would type git remote and then space rm for remove and then the name of it, in this case, origin. So now it's removed it. If I do git remote, you see that it's not there anymore. If I want to add it back, then I just go back up until I find that remote add origin with the URL after it. Now my remote is back again and I'm ready to add code to it. Once we've created a remote repository on GitHub and we've told our project how to find it, now we're ready to create remote branches. Inside your project, let's use git branch to remind ourselves what branches we have. And you can see I'm not on my master branch, so I'm going to go ahead and check out master. Now what I want to do is I want to take that master branch and I want to push all of that code up to the remote repository. Let's say I have some collaborators who are going to be working with it. So I want to push it up there and make it available to them. Now we do this on a branch by branch basis. So I can have local branches that only I see and only I work with. That's great because I can experiment and everyone doesn't have to be looking over my shoulder. But then I can also have branches which are shared and which are remote. So I want to make master into one of those branches while I leave the others all local. So the command we're going to use for that is git push with the dash u option. You don't always have to use u, but it's recommended, especially when you're first creating a branch. We'll talk more about what it is and, and what it does. Git push dash u, and then the alias for the remote, which is origin in this case, and then the branch that we want to push up. So we're saying push to the origin remote, the master branch. Hit return. Now once you do it, it may do a couple of different things. It may go ahead and send this code up to GitHub immediately, like it did for me, or it may pause and ask you to provide your GitHub username and password. Providing your username and password every time is the simplest way to do it. However, you're probably going to want to graduate to doing something else pretty soon. Now my local master branch has been pushed up to the remote. 
Now, things may have gone a little differently for you. You may have also been asked to provide your GitHub username and password. If so, then you would enter those and be able to log in. It can be a little bit of a hassle to do that every single time. So pretty quickly, you're going to want to come up with a different method. And GitHub has some help pages, and there are a number of different ways you can solve that problem. You can store some of that information in local configuration files. You can use a password manager. You can set up a personal token, or you can use SSH keys. If you're going to use multi-factor authentication, then you will need to pick one of those other methods because just a username and password alone won't work. For now, typing in your username and password should have worked so that you're able to see that it says new branch down here, and it tells me that it pushed master to master. It also tells me branch master set up to track remote branch master from origin. So it's going to be tracking it as well. Now, if we say get branch, You'll see we see our list of branches, but nothing is really different. Git branch dash R will show us our remote branches. We have a branch called origin master, which is a remote branch. Git branch dash A shows us all of our branches, both the local ones and the remote branches. Now let's switch back to GitHub for a moment and let's go up here and let's just click on the name of the project again, explore California. And you'll see that now we're seeing a slightly different view. Now we're seeing all of the files that are in the project, the files and folders. And if we click on any one of those, it takes us to a page that has all of our code in it. There's also other nice features like the ability to create issues, pull requests, wiki page, insights, settings. We go back here, we can also take a look at all of the commits that are there, the different branches we have, and so on. There's lots of nice features. You can explore a bit more on your own. Now let's switch back over to our project and let's look at where it stored these files. So in the root of my project, we know we have that .git folder where most things are being stored. I'm going to use ls-la to look at git, and then inside refs, remotes. And in there, you'll see that it created an entry for our origin remote, and it's a directory. So inside remotes origin, you'll see here is master. And what is in master? Can you guess what would be in there? Cat git refs remotes origin master. It contains a SHA. It's a pointer that points to the tip of this branch, just like we talked about at the beginning of this chapter. Now we've created a remote branch and we're ready to start working with it. In the previous chapter, we set up a remote repository at GitHub and pushed some branches to it. That sets the stage for collaboration. In this chapter, we will learn the techniques needed to collaborate with other developers using a remote. Let's begin by learning how to push additional local changes to the remote. Before we can push new changes, we need to make those changes. So the changes I have in mind are going to be to the tours.html page. If you drag this to a browser and open it up, you'll see this is the tours page. And if we scroll down, we have a list of different tours here. Backpack Cal is being one of them. If we click on the link for learn more, you'll see it takes us to a detail page about Backpack Cal. What I want you to notice is that the file name for this is tour underscore detail and then the specific tour, backpack underscore cal. So tour underscore detail is the format of this. Let's click back. If we go down to the next one, California Calm, there's not a file there yet. If I click Learn More, I get File Not Found. But notice the page that it was trying to bring up, Tour Capital Detail, instead of Tour Underscore Detail. And the same thing is true for all of these other placeholder links that we have. They follow a different style than the page that we actually have. So I want to make that consistent. So the change we're going to make is to make those consistent with the one that exists. So let's go into our text editor, and let's open up the tours.html page. And let's do a find and let's search for tour capital detail. And then you can click find in Atom text editor. It goes ahead and tells me that there are eight of them found. And then I'm going to change all of those to be tour underscore detail. Now, right now this is a case insensitive match. I can also make it a case sensitive match. That may be a little better. And it jumped me right to the first one here, tour detail calm. So I'm going to say replace for this one. And then it goes to the next one, and I'm just going to hit replace on all of them. You can do this manually if you'd rather, but I'm just going to use the find and replace because it's a little faster. Now they've all been changed to match that same format. I'll close my search box, save the file, and now we know that that file has been edited. We can see our changes are here waiting for us to do something with them. So let's commit them, am, and let's say the message is changes, URL format on tours page. Okay, so now I have my new commit locally. 
It's not on the remote yet. It's just on my local machine. Let's type git log dash dash one line dash five. We'll see the last five commits. And you can see here's my new commit right here, FAFCD6E. Now my remote origin master is still pointing at this commit, right? This is on my master branch, but not on my remote branch. And we can actually hit the up arrow and type origin master and see the same top five commits for it and see that it ends right there at that D104. So I just wanna make this point very clear. When we did git log, there's two different things we can look at. We can look at master, which is our local branch, and then there's origin master, and that is the tracking branch for the remote branch. It's not the actual remote branch, it's a tracking branch that we have on our local computer. If I was on an airplane with no ability to contact the remote server, I would get the same answer. This is information that's on our computer already. We can also use git diff to see the difference between these, master and origin master. Although since origin master is actually behind master, it probably makes more sense to do it this way to show the changes from origin to master. What has changed since I last merged in with that tracking branch? We can see those changes. Even better would be to do it with the color words option, dash dash color words. And now you can see exactly what changed in that commit. Okay, so now we have changes locally. We wanna push those up to the remote. So as you might expect, we use git push for that, just like we did before. We don't need to specify the dash u option because it's already a tracking branch. Remember we did that before when we were pushing the first time to make it a tracking branch at the same time. Now we just do a regular git push. And then you wanna specify origin master. That's the alias for the remote that we're pushing to and the branch that we're pushing, we're pushing all the information from master to the origin branch. But here's where the benefit of having a tracking branch starts to pay off. If you have it as a tracking branch, then it already knows that you're tracking origin and you wanna push master to it. So you can just simply type git push and get the same result. It comes up and it tells me that it sent data up to the remote branch. And we can see that if we now go back up to the log one line of origin master, and we'll see now origin master points to this same commit. We can also go to GitHub and see it there. Here I am on the GitHub website, and let's just reload the page. And you can see that it says that the most recent changes changes URL format on the tours page. And if I click on it, you'll see that it shows me that commit. So that commit now has been pushed up. So now our local commit has been pushed to the remote and it's available for our collaborators to work with. Let's examine what happens when we want to push some local changes up to a remote branch that has been updated by other people. So the scenario would look something like this. We have the remote server and it has three commits on it. We have the local repository on our computer, which also has three commits. Everything is in sync. So then I start work for the day. And let's say I spend an hour putting it together a commit and I commit it to my local repository. During the time that I was doing my work, my collaborators were also working and they already pushed up their changes to the remote server. Now, if I go and try to push my changes to the remote server, it will fail. And it's not failing because there's a conflict. It's not as if someone has made two changes to the same line and Git doesn't know how to sort it out. It's because there are new commits there and Git doesn't know what to do with our new commit. Our new commit presumably is supposed to go after F36DE. So how is it supposed to do that? Is it going to replace the other commits that my collaborators have made? Should it put it at the end? It doesn't know how to resolve it. The branch can't have two endpoints. Instead, I need to perform a fetch so that I now have those local changes, and then I need to merge them together. And that could be a fast forward merge, or it could be a non fast forward merge that has an actual merge commit. But I need to resolve things locally so that then once things are tidy, then I can push them up to the remote server. And the remote server will be able to accommodate those changes and we'll be able to have one endpoint at the end. So just to be clear, it's not because there's a conflict between two files, like there would be an emerge conflict. That's not the issue here. The issue is that Git doesn't know how it should structure the changes in the new timeline. So if you try to do a push and Git rejects it, then you need to fetch, merge, and then push again. In this movie, we will look at an example workflow showing how to use Git to collaborate with another user. My hope is that this kind of real world example will help to give you a big picture and pull together all the different pieces we've learned. We're not going to actually make the changes that would take more time and would keep you from seeing the workflow as clearly. 
For this example, I'm going to collaborate with my coworker, Linda, on adding a new feature to the Explore California website. And our new feature will be a feedback form, so the customers of Explore California can share their comments and feedback. Let's start by looking at what my work would look like. Now this is an ongoing project. I've already got repositories set up and I've already pushed at least the master branch up to the remote repositories. That work's been done ahead of time. Today, I'm gonna to start work on this new feature. I'm probably already on my master branch, but if not, I'm gonna check out master to make sure I am. And the very first thing we wanna do every day when we start work, every time we've been away from the computer for a few hours, is we wanna do a git fetch so that we can sync up our tracking branch with the remote repository. We wanna find out what new commits have been made and pushed to the repository since the last time we checked in. I do my fetch, and it turns out that there was work done overnight by some of my coworkers. Their commits are unrelated to the feature I'm about to add, but I still wanna incorporate them into master. So the next thing I'll do is I'll do git merge origin master, and that'll bring those changes into my master branch. Now I'm ready to start work on my feature. I'm going to do the work on my feature in a separate branch so that it won't interfere with anything that's going on in master. And that way, if we decide not to use the feature for some reason, it's also easy to throw it away. So the next thing I'll do is create a new branch using checkout-b that will check out the new branch and switch me to it. So then I'll open up my working directory, I'll get the code into my code editor, and I'll start making the changes. I'll add a new page called feedback.html, and I'll make the form look exactly like I want. When I'm done, and I'm ready to make my commit. So we'll use git add to add the feedback form, and git to commit to commit it. We also know that we could do that all in one step. So now my feature is complete and it's on my local repository inside this feedback form branch. But I'm not ready to merge them into master yet. Instead, I want my coworker Linda to have a look at them as well. So I need to put them on the remote repository where she can see them. Before I push them up there, I wanna do a fetch again to find out if any more commits have been made that I wanna take into consideration. In this example, there are no other commits. So I go ahead and I push my branch up to master. I do that using git push with the dash u option to make it track the branch and then provide origin to specify the remote and then feedback form to specify the branch. When that's done, my work is now on the remote repository so that my coworkers can all see it. So I send an email to Linda saying that I've posted this and I'd like to get her thoughts on it. Now let's switch over and look at things from Linda's point of view. Let's also assume that Linda already has the repository and she's been working on it for a couple of weeks. If she didn't have it, then she could do git clone in order to get the repository. But let's assume that she's already on the master branch or she'll do git checkout to get there. The very first thing that Linda's going to do is also a git fetch. That's always the first thing. Until she does that fetch, she can't even see the branch that I just pushed up there. Her computer hasn't sunk up with the remote repository. It doesn't know information about other branches or commits that have been made since she last did a git fetch. After she fetches though, git branch dash r will show her the new branch so that she can see it. Git fetch also shows her that there were other changes that came in from coworkers, so she also wants to do git merge origin master so that her master branch is always brought up to date. It's not strictly necessary, but it is a good practice. After she's done that, she's ready to take a look at the work that I emailed her about. She'll check out the branch using git checkout with the dash b option that's going to both create the branch and check it out so that she can use it, and notice that we also specify origin slash feedback form. If we didn't have that extra argument there, then feedback form would be a new branch off of the current branch, which is master, and that's not what we want. So this will create a new branch that tracks the branch that I pushed up. Now Linda has it in her working directory. She can poke through the files. She can call git log to see what changes I've made. She can use git show to probe into each one of those commits. She can bring up the form in her browser. Try it out, see what she thinks. After looking at my commit and bringing it up in the browser, Linda decides that we should add a select option to the form so that customers can pick which tour they took and then include that with the feedback. And we'll know which tour they're referencing in their comments. So she makes this additional change and then she's gonna commit it. She's gonna use the dash A option this time to commit it all in one step. Now Linda has her change in her local repository and she needs to put it on the remote where I can see it. So she does a git fetch to make sure that no new changes have come in, and then she'll do a git push. She doesn't need to specify the repository or the branch because it's a tracking branch. Git already knows. At this point, Linda's done. So she sends me back an email saying that everything looks great, but she made one quick change. So on my side again, I wanna see what change she just provided. So the first thing I do is git fetch. 
so that now my local repository knows about the change that's been posted on the remote. Before I merge it in though, I want to take a look at it. So I'll use git log with the dash p option, which is short for patch, and that'll show me details about each one of the commits. And I'm going to limit the scope of what I'm looking at for all changes from the pointer of feedback form up to the pointer of origin feedback form. It's a lot like doing a diff between those two endpoints, but instead we'll see each of the changes as individual commits. So I take a look at her changes, and I think she had a good idea. I like the changes and I want to incorporate them. So now I'll use git merge origin feedback form. That'll merge in those changes. And now my feature is complete and it's ready to be merged into master. So I'll git check out master to get back on the master branch. I'll call git fetch again to find out if anything new has come on, on the repository in the meantime. And if there are changes, I'll use git merge origin master to bring it completely up to date. If I don't, then I potentially would be blocked from doing a push later on. Once I know that my version of master is current, then I can merge in the changes that make up the feature I'm implementing in the feedback form. This will mean that my local version of master now has these changes. So at the end, I also need to do a git push, which is going to push my local version of master back up to the remote repository. Now my new feature is on the remote server in the master branch where all of my coworkers can see it and work with it. It'll eventually be deployed on the Explore California website. That should give you an idea of the process which you go through when you're collaborating with coworkers. It may change because you're collaborating with three or four different people who all may be checking in and out things, but it's the same basic process over and over again. It may seem like a lot to remember when you're a beginner, but it becomes second nature very quickly. Thank you for taking Git, Branches, Merges, and Remotes with me. We've covered some powerful techniques for managing your source code. You will have more confidence to make big changes knowing that your old versions are only just a few keystrokes away. You will feel empowered to try new ideas and code branches without worrying that you might break the main project. Or you'll be able to collaborate more effectively with other Git users, whether it's on your own project, a company or client project, or an open source project. Before I leave you, I want to suggest some next steps you may want to explore. The first is that Git allows you to create aliases for commonly used commands. If you have to type fewer keystrokes to execute a command, it can speed up your workflow. You can add aliases using a command like this, git config and then dash dash global alias dot and then the keystrokes you want to use as an alias and then in quotes what it should be an alias for. So this is adding an alias so that I can type st instead of status. So git st would do the same thing as typing git status. You can type these commands or you can edit the git config file directly. Here are some popular aliases in my git config file st for status, co for checkout, ci for commit, I think of it as checkout and check in, co and ci, br for branch, df for diff, dfs for diff staged, and this one's very helpful, log with an extra g at the end. That does log graph decorate one line all. We've used that a couple of times, and that's a lot to type. Typing log with another g is much shorter. Aliases can speed up your work, but beginners should learn the real commands well before depending on shortcuts. Second, you can also set up SSH keys for remote login. Setting up SSH keys is beyond the scope of this course, but most developers using Git use them. The idea is to create two mathematically linked files, and then you put the public one on a remote server and keep the private one on your own computer. When you go to log in, the two files interact and you're authenticated. GitHub has some help pages to get you started at help.github.com slash en slash articles slash set dash up dash git. This page may evolve over time, but it's going to give you the basics of how to get set up with git. And if you scroll down a bit, you'll see next steps authenticating with GitHub from git. And it gives you a couple of options. With HTTPS, you can cache your GitHub password in git, or connecting over SSH, you can generate SSH keys. And those will link you to guides that will help you to do that. A bonus is that SSH keys can be used to log into other servers as well. My SSH keys allow me to access GitHub as well as all of my development and production servers without needing to type a password. There are also many Integrated Development Environments, or IDEs, which integrate source code editing with Git features. And there are many applications which provide graphical user interfaces, or GUIs. They have a point-and-click interface for performing Git actions. The list is constantly changing for these, so I won't give you suggestions, but they're easy to find. 
try a few and see which one is most helpful. You can also continue learning in another course in the library, Get Intermediate Techniques. In that course, we cover pruning branches, working with tags, interactive staging, cherry picking commits, creating and applying patches, rebasing, squashing commits, and techniques to track down problems. There's a lot more to learn still. I hope you will continue learning and using Git. It is an indispensable tool that can improve the quality of your code and make your life as a developer easier. Until next time, happy coding!